All right. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Feeding Winter Birds, a DNR uh, Outdoor Skills Academy virtual. Um, so what I'd like to do is just give kind of an overview of how this program will work today and what you can expect. And then we'll introduce ourselves and then we are going to dive right in for this three hour session of all kinds of fun things, birds and bird feeding. Um, so first I'm going to advance my slide. Let me get my bearings here. <laughs> And so this is what your screen will look like approximately. Um, you can kind of manipulate it to do what you want it to. So on the right there, you should see me um, and you can make me or the presenter bigger or smaller as needed. On the left will be the PowerPoint slide that we'll be talking about. That'll be our content. So however you're comfortable with that. Um, there's also a chat available for everyone, um, and we will have a monitor for both the chat and the questions and answers. Um, chat is going to be a little bit more informal. Um, if you have a comment about something, um, we have a couple of questions we'll ask throughout the program. You can answer it there. If you have a question for one of our presenters, um, we'd ask that you put that question um, in the actual question and answer portion. So again, the chat is a little bit more informal and the question and answer is for a specific content related question. And again, we have a moderator for those. We'll kind of share in that responsibility. So now I'd like to introduce our team here. Um, I'll start with me. I am Shana Ramsey and I am the fisheries interpreter at the Wolf Lake State Fish Hatchery. So I am located in Madawan, Michigan. So just west of Kalamazoo. I do a lot with fish, but birds are also a passion of mine and we are a wonderful birding hotspot. Um, and so that's kind of where I got started um, with my love of birds is when I really started at Wolf Lake for the DNR almost 20 years ago. And then I'd like to introduce the rest of our team. Um, we have Elizabeth Brockwell Tillman and she is at the beautiful Hoffmaster State Park on Lake Michigan in Muskegon at the Genevieve Gillette Sand Dune Visitor Center. So welcome, Elizabeth. And then we have Miss Holly Vaughn, who is located at Mayberry State Park, so in Northville over in Southeast Michigan. And she is our State Park Explorer Program Coordinator. That is a mouthful, Holly. Um, and so we will be your team today. We'll kind of be switching on and off. Um, a few things uh, to go over, kind of housekeeping. Uh, we will have a couple of breaks, so for bathroom and, you know, get a cup of coffee, that kind of thing. So know that we will work those into the session. Um, we will be recording the session. So we will make it available um, after. I don't know if it'll be, you know, right away, but we would hope to, you know, within the next week or maybe a little more, um, we're going to have to trim it down quite a bit, but it will be available to you as a recorded session. We had a few people that couldn't make it today, so it'll be there for them. We will also be following up with some resources to your email. Um, you will get all of the PowerPoint slides that we're gonna be showing today. We will put those into a PDF for you and email that to you. And um, we will also provide a whole slew of web resources and some um, homemade bird treat recipes and other fun things. So we will follow up with that. And, um, oh, and, we wanted to share with you that between the three of us, we counted it up and we have 65 years of birding experience. So hopefully um, that will benefit you today with this session. Um, so with that, I am gonna get right into um, the agenda to show you what this session is really gonna be structured like. Um, we'll do these introductions and then we'll talk about why feeding birds, You know, why do we do it? Should we do it? Some of the pros and cons and some of the things you can expect um, here in Michigan and why. So we'll talk through that and then we'll jump with Elizabeth into some of the birds that you can expect at your feeders, which is a great session. Um, we'll get a quick break after that and then we will go into the top 10 foods to offer your birds and which ones attract which birds and then the different kinds of feeder types and which birds use them. We'll talk about how to and why it's important to keep your feeders clean, which is a big thing that we wanna to stress today with our session. Um, and then we'll go through just kind of a few things here and there, tips and tricks, um, some citizen science, if you wanna take it a step further um, and how you can get involved. And then our resources and conclusion. 
And most importantly, we have door prizes. But friends, you have to be present to win. So stick around to the end. Elizabeth got some really great prizes and we'll draw names um, and hand, and then we'll send those to you. So that's what we're looking like today. Uh, so let's get started. Oh, I forgot one more thing. Gosh, we have so much fun stuff. Um, uh, we will be sending each of you in the mail a copy of this wonderful resource, Feeder Birds. And so this has a lot of the information we're going to be sharing with you today. And it's just a great guide to keep next to the window where you're watching your birds for identification purposes. But it's got a ton of the information. And as much as I love a lot of the digital resources out there, there is nothing better than a good old fashioned field guide. So having this um, will be a real benefit to you. And Elizabeth, did you want to share a little bit about that process to get these to folks? Yes. Okay. So the first 18 people I believe that registered for the webinar uh, will get their books in the next couple of days if they haven't gotten them already, because I sent those out about midweek. But it's been hard for me to get enough copies of this book. We had so many people register for the webinar uh, and that caught us off guard a little bit. So I've been scrambling with Amazon to find the books and they are coming. They're just coming from different places and it's going to take longer for some to get here than others. And then um, this whole team is going to be gone next week. So I will not be... Um, able to ship books out um, mid next week. And it might be the end of the week before they get sent out. So just have some patience. It is coming. We haven't forgotten you and you will get your book. All right. Thanks, Elizabeth. Now, friends, here we go. Um, acknowledgements. If you have not been to this website, um, the allaboutbirds.org from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, um, I strongly encourage you to check it out. There's a ton of resources. We'll talk about some of them today. Um, but really a lot of the content we got from this page, they have an entire section um, and it's all research-based that is dedicated specifically to feeder birds. Uh, so that's where a lot of our content came from. So I just wanted to give a shout out to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. All right, so next I wanna talk about why do people feed birds um, and what, what does it do for people? So I've got this great little video I'm gonna share. It's gonna take me a second to pull it up. And hold on. Let's see if I got my tech. Let me close this. All right, here we go, friends. So let's watch this short video about feeding birds. Bird feeding makes me feel fantastic. Well, watching birds at my feeder in the morning is zen. Watching birds at your feeder is like free TV. Cut yeah. the cable. Well, my favorite feeder bird is a titmouse. I like the uh, black-capped chickadee. The little red-breasted nuthatch. It's kind of the squeaky toy of birds, I think. The Carolina wren is a close second. I like the blue jays because blue is my favorite color. The first bird feeder I ever hung up um, was probably an orange feeder. OK, I've tried a lot of feeders that have failed. And I really wanted a Baltimore Oriole. And I never got my Baltimore Oriole. I. I kind of went down the rabbit hole um, and then I was hooked and then I got a platform feeder and then I got a suet feeder and then I got a hummingbird feeder. But I got a gray catbird and I don't know if the bird knows it but we're probably best friends now. My grandmother has a bird feeder and I have a bird feeder and we don't live close to each other and wouldn't you know our bird feeders rank very highly on our list of conversations. Feeding birds makes me feel happy. Actually getting to see birds up close, that causes pure joy in my family. We run to the windows, we point at it, and we say, look, there's a goldfinch, look, there's a goldfinch. When birds come, they bring love to the world, basically. And I agree, they bring love to the world. I love that. I could not have said it better myself. It's much better coming from that young lady. But yeah, so birds, um, they mean a lot to a lot of people. So let's kind of get into what birds have meant to you up, up until um, getting registered for this webinar. So there's some reason you came here. So um, what we're going to do next 
is a little quiz. And so what we're going to well, Watching birds Hold at on. my feeder in the morning is then. I still have that video open. I think I got it. All right. Sorry about that, friends. Okay, so we're going to do a quiz and I'm going to ask a question. It'll pop up on the screen and then I, we want you to answer in the chat and then Holly's just going to share some of our answers, you know, um, that we get. So we just kind of want to see where all of you are at with your, your birding leading up to where we are today. And so the first question is... So Shana, is it your, looks like, yeah. sorry to interrupt, it looks like the chat is disabled, but you can answer in the Q&A. Okay. Okay. So the chat is disabled. So that must have been when this was set up through our... Yeah. Okay, so all Q&A today, friends. So thank you, Holly, for that update. Sorry about that, but we'll we'll make it work. All right, so what is your favorite bird? Mine is what you see on the screen here, the black-capped chickadee, but we want to see what yours are. So let's give it a minute, and then Holly will read some of those, those answers. We've got four responses. Let's keep going, guys. Oh, there it's going, going right up. Looks like we've got lots of votes for cardinals and bluebirds. People love woodpeckers too. They're so awesome to watch. Um, we've got a vote for goldfinches and chickadees, a whippoorwill. Oh, I love whippoorwills. You don't hear those very much anymore these days. Um, robins, Carolina wrens, eagles. Who's got eagles coming to their bird feeder? That's cool. <laughs> well, I didn't birds. say it had to be a feeder bird. I just said birds. So Favorite bird. Okay. I don't know about whippoorwills either. <laughs> Indigo bunting. Yes, that's a beautiful one. Wood duck. Nice. House finch. Awesome. Cool. That's a good response. All right, friends, here's our next question. We've got three total. So the next question is, how long have you been watching birds? Maybe this is brand new for you, or maybe you are just, you know, doing this to get some new tips and tricks. So we want to know, how long have you been watching birds? It doesn't have to be just feeder birds. It could just be all together. So remember, Elizabeth... Holly and I had 65 years all together. Elizabeth led the pack, by the way. So I was second, Holly third, all with strong numbers. All right, what do we got, Holly? What's coming in? Hmm. Looks like we've got six years, three years, 10 years, 30 years. Ooh. Uh, 10 plus years, three years, 11, 15, another 30 plus. Nice. Six, five, 25, another 30. And my whole life, 63 years. Oh, I love it. <laughs> That's awesome. Awesome. All right. Since I was a kid. <laughs> some seasoned birders in this group. All right. Yes. Next question. How many bird feeders do you have currently? How many bird feeders do you have? I want to see who has the most. I'm super, I'm very curious. All right, what are we getting there, Holly? You're muted, Holly. So far, seven is the highest number I see. Okay, that's solid. Seven. A couple of sevens. Ooh, we got an eight. Cool. Seven so guys, out. Ooh, 11. This is a very uh, familiar bird group, so this should be yes. fun. 11, is that our high? So far. Well, there's one that says they've got seven out now, but there's five more in the shed, which would make 12. Okay, so 12. All right. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that counts. For sure. All right, here we go. So let's talk about just birding. So what what is it, right? So bird watching is naming the bird. So you're looking at the size, the shape, the color, the habitat, the behavior, 
all of these things are going to get us to what you know we want to to know the type of bird and and learning all these things and it's really about an interaction between birds and their environment um the great thing about birding and i think why i love it so much is that you can do it anywhere backyard you could do it at a state park or a wilderness area a nature preserve or outside your window. So it's accessible to a lot of people. And I think that that's something that makes it really special. And on that note, um, there are a lot of birders out there. 45 million Americans now call themselves bird watchers. And birders now outnumber hunters and anglers in the United States, which I thought was a pretty impressive statistic. Um, the US Fish and Wildlife Service report from 2016 said that, or found that 36 billion, that's with a B, um, is spent on bird, food, binoculars, and travel. And as you can imagine with the pandemic, um, with everybody home, I mean, birding really increased from that too. So it gave people something to do um, during all of that time at home. So birding is big business and a lot of people are are into it. Um, so how is how does that tie in with all conservation? Um, it's important to know that, let me just see, no, okay, I thought I skipped a slide, um, that conservation is funded here in the state of Michigan. And so this would mean um, not just bird conservation and maybe uh, wild areas, but it in includes everything. It includes our stewardship, it includes um, wildlife, it includes fisheries, so hunting and fishing as well. All of that is funded primarily from the sale of hunting and fishing licenses. So there may be people out there that don't hunt, but they want to support conservation. The way that you can do that is by purchasing a fishing license, for example. It's $26, um, which is a steal of a deal. I tell you what, I took my daughter, we had mommy daughter day um, when dad and sister were doing things and we went to the movies and we got one bottled water and we got a small popcorn. And that was $12, I think for those snacks, we snuck in some uh, chocolate of our own. And then our tickets were $27. So actually more for us to sit at the movie theater, just two of us, um, then, you know, a, a fishing license for world-class, you know, resources. So just something to consider that that's how all conservation is, is funded and it's relatively inexpensive in the grand scheme of things. Um, but there, there are other ways too, if you don't want to purchase a hunting or fishing license, um, you can get the license plate, which this year, the non-game Fish and Wildlife Trust Fund um, features the Kirtland's Warbler, which is very exciting. And so it's $35. You would do this when you register your car to get a new license plate. And I read that 25 of those 35 go straight to that fund, which is, is pretty good when you consider a lot of times, you know, when you purchase or make donations, not all of it goes to, to what you want it to, to that fund, but 25 of the $35 do in this case. So that's another way that you could support um, conservation in Michigan. And then um, if you're not familiar with the federal duck stamp program, this um, is something you can do uh, each year is to purchase one of these stamps. Um, I'm gonna read this little excerpt and it looks like they were $25 in 2022. Nearly all duck stamp proceeds are used to conserve wildlife habitat for birds and other wildlife. Birders, nature photographers, and other outdoor enthusiasts buy the stamps to help ensure that they can always see wildlife at their favorite outdoor spots. So again, for a relatively small purchase, um, you can help support the um, National Wildlife Refuge System with the purchase of a duck stamp. So some things to consider. Um, in Michigan, we have a lot of birds. We have over 400, I don't know what the exact number is, but over 400 um, birds that have been identified here. And the reason we have so many, so much variety of birds is really about location, location, location. So if you look at these two maps on the left, you see in that green, uh, the Mississippi Flyway. So this is where birds are flying um, during their migration. Um, so they're going north, obviously, during the breeding season and headed south during the, um, the winter season. And you can see that Michigan is completely covered by this flyway. And then if we look to the right, 
we can see that the Atlantic Flyway here, a lot of Michigan is covered, not as much, um, but the eastern kind of half of lower Michigan, as well as the UP. And so we're really in this wonderful spot where we get a lot from both of these flyways. Um, and it's important to note, too, that we may be the southernmost spot for some birds. Your dark-eyed juncos, American tree sparrows, white crown sparrows, you know, we are their southern location. Um, whereas other birds, like ducks, for example, who need open water um, to feed, are gonna continue through Michigan um, down where there's open water during the winter. So um, a lot of the uh, this, this map was taken from the Cornell um, lab of ornithology site and you can see them for all the different species so it's a really good resource there too but we are the southern spot for a lot of birds. So the thing about feeder birds is that a lot of them look fairly similar. Um, I always say the nice thing about bird feeding and bird feeder birds is that there's not as much variety right so once you learn you know 20 birds, you've got most of them, and then you might get some unique ones that kind of pop in and out. But they all have pretty similar characteristics. At least, you know, there's a junco, and then there's your white crown sparrow, and then there's your white throated sparrow. So learning the special characteristics of each individual bird, just kind of basic bird ID, but really focusing on whether that's the white throated sparrow, that big white spot on their, you know, on their neck. Those are the kinds of things you want to start doing as you're trying to identify the birds. And your um, feeder guides will help you with that. And the more you see them, the easier it gets. So a question that is often asked is, you know, why do people feed birds? And also, should we be feeding birds? So with that, um, let's talk a little bit about the history of feeding birds. And so it really begins back, um, they say, they, I don't know who they is, but an article I read said, Henry David Thoreau was really kind of the first person documented to feed birds. And what he did is he just threw out some extra, whether it was corn, Corn or just some extra food and he threw it out the back door and he wanted to see what was going to come to it. And so um, he he was, you know, really happy to see that lots of things came to it. And so it started to get popularized just with extra things that people would throw out. It wasn't that people were going and purchasing. It was just that they had extra stuff, they threw it out. And that's kind of how bird feeding started. And it was kind of just this casual thing that was done. However, it exploded in the 1980s. And a lot of that is a result of accessible bird feed. And so it started to be sold at hardware stores at some of the big box stores. You know, now you can get it at Home Depot and Lowe's and Menards and all of those places. So as it became more accessible for people, more people started to do it. And so that's kind of where we're still at. In addition to obviously the pandemic, a lot of things, you know, came out of that. But that's where the historical perspective is. It's also an industry. So $4 billion a year is spent on bird seed in the United States. And then another almost $1 billion years in feeders and accessories. So there's a lot attached to this industry in the United States and really worldwide. Um, but what the question uh, people often ask is, should we be feeding birds? Is it a good thing for the birds? And so we might ask, um, here's our statement, excuse me. Um, if supplemental feeding is ecologically detrimental, then our expectation would be that long-term population declines in species that consume supplemental feed. So the birds that we're feeding are going to suffer some in some way if we're continue to feeding them because they're not finding it on their own or whatever angle you want to take. But that, that could be an expectation if we think it's a bad thing. Here's what the research shows. Um, for 50 years of data, they looked at 135 different species. And so the supplementally fed birds were doing the best year over year. And obviously there's a few exceptions here and there. What the study also found is that the bird species that were in the most trouble were things like seabirds and shorebirds. Um, those birds don't come to feeders and those were suffering due to other threats. Um, they were suffering mostly because of habitat loss. And so supplementally feeding birds is, through research, not known to be detrimental to the birds. So is it a good thing? Well, one of the main 
benefits is when there is harsh weather, like the big blizzard we had here in Southwest Michigan right around Christmas, when we have really harsh weather during the winter um, that we're supplementally feeding them when they can't find food. And so that's probably the biggest benefit to them. It's also something as they're migrating, um, that it's a food, an easy food source, fast food, if you want to look at it like that, um, that they are going to be able to get a quick, high energy, high protein content meal on their way through. Um, we're really doing it for us, I think, for the most part, right? We're feeding these birds because we want to connect with nature. Um, inviting unexpected natural beauty into your yard every day connecting with the outdoors and with nature and with other living creatures. So that's really what we can say is the benefit to feeding birds. And in instances of bad, harsh weather, it's helping them as well. There are risks involved, and we'll get into these in a little bit more detail later. Um, but there can be window strikes. So if you're familiar with those, the reflection that a bird sees on your window Often they will think that it is, you know, if there's a reflection of trees, for example, they think they can continue flying, that those trees are more for us and they hit the window um, to their detriment. So that is one thing. Uh, there are ways you can put, you know, you can put decals on your windows, you can put string. I mean, there's there's all, all things under the radar. Elizabeth has done some work at Hoffmaster with that. So window strikes are a consideration. Um, that's where placement comes into um in being important and where you're placing them. And obviously we've got this little guy in the lower right here. They could become food for other animals, right? That would be a fast meal for this hawk. If they, if you had bird feeders, they might start to learn that that's an easy meal. And then also there are disease considerations, which Holly will talk in depth about later in Elizabeth as well. So there are things you have to consider when you're doing this. All right, so now let's get into the nitty gritty. And that is with Elizabeth. She is gonna talk about some of the species you can expect at your feeders. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. We're gonna do a little transition here and then we will, let's see, stop. Okay, everybody. I am going to share my screen. I get my video going here. There we go. So we're going to get into some of the bigger details about feeding winter birds. So the list of birds we see in the wintertime is short. And Shana alluded to that. It's much shorter than the expanded population that can travel through where we live, our areas in the spring and summer and add greatly to the um, amount of birds that we are seeing. So if you're new, new to bird watching, this is a great time of year to get started because your list of birds you're gonna see at your feeders is only about 20 different types. And there may be some additionals that come in from time to time, but for the most part, you've only got to worry about this short little list. Um, so there's a lot less birds to learn, which is a good thing if you're new to bird watching. Um, I have listed the 20 species here that you're most likely to see at your feeder or in your area. And as I mentioned, in certain regions of the state, this list could be a little bit longer. Now, other visitors that will come to our feeders occasionally, depending on what kind of weather patterns are happening throughout the state and in Canada, um, the, the white-winged crossbill and the red crossbill are two birds that we possibly can see, you know, depending on where you live. Um, and of course, depending on how harsh the weather conditions are in other parts of the region. Now, crossbills are a classic example of a bird that migrates for the purpose of finding food. When it's very harsh in the north, they lose food supply, and so they'll start to travel south. Now, white-winged and red, red um, crossbills, you know, they really have no true migration. You can't consider this migration. They're moving in search of plentiful cone crops. If you aren't familiar with this bird, look at, look closely at the picture in the center there and look at the beak, how it's crossed. 
Uh, that is an excellent tool for accessing the seeds that are inside fir, pine, and spruce cones. So these birds are most often seen in flocks. And they're very common in northern Michigan, um, but we do see them in th the southern region of the state when the winter is extremely harsh in the north. Um, you can never be sure where you're going to find these hardy travelers uh, because they will, like I said, move around in search of food. And that demographic map over there on the right hand side shows how their normal region is in the purple. And this dashed line below that shows you how far south they can actually go in search of food. So the Carolina wren is small and has that typical upturned wren tail. They are common in the southern half of the state and their populations rise and fall in northern parts of their range and um, you know, decreasing after harsh winters. So uh, their overall population is quite stable but is expanding and we do see them in the southern portion of Michigan. And it wouldn't surprise me if we start seeing them even farther north. I have occasionally seen them at Hoffmaster State Park. I'm over here in Muskegon along the Lake Michigan shoreline. And as you can see, their range extends upward towards us. Now, sparrows are interesting. I love the sparrows. Um, I like the variety of them, the different sizes and their beautiful songs in the spring. Um, fo the fox sparrow uh, is commonly seen at the tail end of winter in the middle of the lower peninsula um, where I work, but they may be seen all winter in the southern half of the state. It depends on the type of winter we're having. They are easy to recognize by their large body size, their decorative plumage, and the, their habit of scratching backwards looking for, um, looking for seed that is underneath the snow. Uh, the uh, white crown sparrow are another feeder visitor, um, and we, we don't see them quite as often, but in some regions of the state, and Shana talked a little bit about this bird, they are quite common in winter. Um, my, you know, their migration times vary and it's influenced again by food and weather. And as the climate warms, these bird populations are shifting northward. Now the white-throated sparrow has that lovely call, you know, old Sam Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. I just love that in the springtime. Um, I typically do not see that bird around here in the winter months, but if you live in southern Michigan, you may. Um, but watch for them in the spring. Then they will come around feeders, especially around the feeder edge. They're a little more cautious about what's going on around them, um, but you will see them looking for seed that's underneath leaf litter or, you know, scattered around the edges of your bird feeding area. Okay, now there's other birds that we'll see, but very much dictated by habitat. So if you live in an area surrounded by mixed woodland with mature trees like I do, you may have pileated woodpeckers that come to your feeders. Um, if you provide suet and peanuts, for instance, uh, this is much more likely because they prefer those types of foods. Now the red-headed woodpecker, which you see over on the right, we rarely see that due to its spe very specific habitat requirements, but it too will also use feeders, particularly peanut feeders. Um, you are more likely to see the red-headed woodpecker if you live near an open savanna, oak woodland with widely spaced trees and standing snags, or if you're adjacent to a park that has these types of habitats. Now the red-headed woodpeckers, um, they prefer low predator pressure. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you don't have European starlings in your area and you don't have Cooper's hawks and you have the type of habitat they prefer, you have a greater chance of seeing them. So research has shown that they also prefer to live where there are no red-bellied woodpeckers. Now here at my home, I have red-bellied woodpeckers. I never see the red-headed woodpecker here. Even though around the area, there is some um, decent habitat for them, but because we have so many red-bellied woodpeckers here, which tend to be more aggressive than the red-headed, we just never see red-headed woodpeckers here. But at my summer home in Pentwater, we have that widely spaced um, oak 
um, forest. You know, the trees aren't bunched together. They're widely spaced out. And we have no red-bellied woodpeckers. And so, of course, we see the red-headed woodpecker there all the time. So kind of interesting how um, each type of bird species has their preferred habitat and their requirements. Um, now, the red-headed woodpecker is a very nomadic nut lover. They love nuts. So if you think you might have them in your area or you have seen them, if you want to get them to come into your feeding area, be sure that you put out a variety of nuts for them. Now, they also, both of these woodpecker, well, every woodpecker I've mentioned so far, eat a fair amount of insects and are known, um, you know, they're known for their ability to consume quite a bit of insect larvae and of course flying insects, especially the redhead woodpecker, which is very good at catching um, insects on the fly. Um, so in the if you provide suet in the winter time, that's also gonna be a good attractant to them. It's gonna be a replacement for the insect food that they're normally searching for. Now, birds will be attracted to your backyard if you provide them with their basic needs. I mean, isn't that true of all of us? We gravitate to the places that provide us with the things that make our lives easier. So you have to think about the things that they're going to need, food, the water, and the shelter, and of course, a certain level of safety. And every bird species has a different threshold for what their safety range uh, needs to include. So a variety of natural and provided foods is best displayed at varying heights. And that's going to attract the greatest number of birds for you. Now, open water and shelter from wind and winter elements will also attract birds to your yard. Shelter provided by evergreens is a great draw because the snow on those branches can create shelter and thermal protection. Lastly, if your yard is free of predators, especially house cats, this will make it a, a very good safe haven for your bird neighbors. So you have to think, I mean, we can't control our neighbor's cat, not usually, but, um, you know, cats are, they're just doing what comes natural to them and they are very dominant predators in bird feeding areas. So hopefully you can keep them out of your space because you'll have more birds if you can. So a bird's primary job in winter time is to find enough food to survive. In winter, food equals heat. Birds stay warm by being active, but this requires a lot of energy. So access to high quality foods for energy is essential to birds in the winter. Providing a variety of food types will attract a diverse group of bird species. Now remember, seeds are only part of that equation. Some birds like woodpeckers, as I mentioned, um, and others eat a fair amount of insects. These birds, of course, will transition when insects become scarce in the cold months. They're more likely to come to your yard if you provide suet. But native plantings can also be um, a great benefit. So native plantings like fruit bearing trees and shrubs can also be an excellent source of nutrients for these birds. Native plants can greatly increase your chances of attracting birds to your yard. So birds attracted to winter fruits, like, and that includes like robins, bluebirds, gross beaks, blue jays, waxwings, woodpeckers, some of our favorites, right? So fruit bearing trees and shrubs are also attractive to, I'm going to say the word caterpillars. A lot of people don't like caterpillars, but I'm going to talk about them for a few minutes here. My daughter used to shriek when she would see one. She, here I am a naturalist and I had a child that hated caterpillars, but Caterpillars are really important to birds. Um, they provide them with so much food. So um, to illustrate an, a really important point here, I want to throw out the statistic. So there's an entomologist named Doug Tallamy, and he has done extensive research, of course, on caterpillars. And one of the things that he and his grad students have discovered through their research is that native oak trees support more than 550 different species of caterpillars, a butterfly and moth caterpillars. And the non-native ginkgo tree only supports five. So native plants are going to be the foundation for your 
bird space in your backyard because birds that live here are naturally attracted to the plants that that are native to our state and especially for birds the, those fruit bearing things critically important now so you're probably wondering why is she talking about caterpillars well because we're focused on winter, right? We're talking about feeding birds in the winter time. So why am I talking about caterpillars? Well, um, do I really think caterpillars are important to consider for your yards? Yes, I do. I think it's really important not to kill the caterpillars that you have living there. Now, in the center of this slide at the top, there's a bunch of yellow-necked oak caterpillars. And when my husband sees those in our yard, he freaks out. He's an old farm boy. He gets out of his spray and he thinks he's going to spray him. I have to stop him every single time. If, he just, if you just leave them alone, the birds come and eat that whole clump. They're gone in a flash. So caterpillars are great foods for birds. And caterpillars are essentially the foundation of the food chain for all songbirds. Now, even the seed eaters that come to your feeders for seed and suet in wintertime feed their young birds, their babies, they feed them caterpillars in the springtime. Caterpillars are soft, easy to find during migration and nesting, and they're packed full of fats, proteins, carotenoids, which are so vital for avian development, little bird development, and feather pigmentation. So without caterpillars, there would be no baby birds, and our migrators would literally starve. So one bird will eat over 300 caterpillars a day. Even in winter, birds will seek out caterpillars that are wintering under tree bark in webbing and crevices. Every single day at the visitor center, I'm sitting in my office, and we have these big windows, and there's caterpillars nesting up in these little webbings in the corner, and the tip mice come in there and get them, and it's great winter food for them. Gives them a little extra fat. So here's a neat statistic. One chickadee pair needs 7,500 caterpillars to rear a clutch of eggs. So do not spray and kill your backyard caterpillars. I hope I've made those of you that don't really like them um, converts to the caterpillar story now. Caterpillars are great and they're great food for birds and we need to preserve them in our yards if we want to have um, a diverse collection of birds to watch. All right, so water is the driving force of all nature. We all know that. Nothing can live without it. So let's not forget how important water is, especially in winter when so much of it is frozen and inaccessible to birds. If there is no snow in your area and temps are below freezing, which um, we haven't had below freezing, too many below freezing temperatures in most of the state this um winter. But if we have those types of conditions, it means there's no water for birds. So open, accessible, warmed water for drinking and bathing will be a bigger attraction than food in your backyard. Homes that provide clean water to birds in winter tend to host the most species. Now at the visitor center where I work at Hoffmaster, we have a large um, bird pond behind the visitor center for our viewing um, pleasure for the pleasure of our visitors and we keep a heater in that so there are heaters available tractor supply blaine's farm and fleet that you can buy they're um not often labeled uh bird pond heater they're most often labeled stock tank heater uh, for livestock and they come in different sizes and wattages and you can use those to keep the water in your bird bath or if you have a bird pond or a small area where water collects, you can keep it um, thawed out that way. Now shelter, it's a good idea to create winter shelter for backyard birds and there are several different ways you can do it. I've pictured some different scenarios here. Evergreen trees and shrubs, of course, are ideal, especially if you avoid trimming off the lower branches. For a quick start, you can build a brush pile in a quiet corner of your yard where it's not going to be such a terrible eyesore for you. You can stack fallen branches, garden clippings, discarded Christmas trees, and other plant material in a cross-hatched pattern to create an inviting shelter. 
Do not be too quick in winter to remove any fallen trees that occur from storms. They create a natural windbreak that will be utilized by many forms of wildlife. Even stacked logs from fallen trees have value as a shelter. We often take the bottom cutting of our personal Christmas tree from our home and turn it upside down by our bird feeders. This creates a great windbreak, but also a sheltered fort for birds to get inside. These types of shelters can also create protection from predators. Now your winter garden. Don't overlook the potential of any garden that you have to provide food and shelter to birds in winter. By leaving your plants standing for the winter, you are providing a valuable service to songbirds. Most people like to clean up their gardens before winter, but I always encourage leaving them for the benefit of other living things. I cannot tell you how many times I've looked out the window of my house in the wintertime and seen birds combing through the plant skeletons looking for seeds and, of course, sometimes just trying to seek shelter from a strong wind coming off Lake Michigan. So these winter gardens can also be great places for hibernating insects. So some of your insect eating birds will find food amongst these plant skeletons as well, where the insects are hiding and trying to hibernate in there. So garden plants make great windbreaks also in hiding places. Fences and natural corners can be valuable cover from the wind. Hedgerows covered in snow are insulated igloos for small birds. And these types of spaces can provide microclimates where even a slight positive difference in temperature can be a benefit. When you, when, when you do trim and prune, and I recommend you wait till late spring to do that if you can, add the cuttings to any brush piles you have to preserve any hiding insects and seed. Now at my house, because I'm on two and a half acres, I have um, vegetation or what I call tree islands all throughout the property. So we have paths because we had horses and our girls had had a carriage and they like to, you know, ride on these little man-made trails um, through our property. So, but we have these big vegetation islands and what we do every fall is blow the leaves into them so that we're preserving whatever's living amongst the leaf litter. It gets, just gets pushed to that spot. And of course those decay over time and create valuable compost for other plants. But also that way we are not removing any of the other life that might be in those um, plant material and that type of plant material. And then the birds of course can still find, find those foods there. So it's a good way to, it's a good way to handle it if you have some property um, so you can just kind of pile everything up in one spot and preserve it over time. All right, something else you can do, especially if you don't have a lot of space, is you can provide um, these wonderful roosting boxes. So some people, if you have nesting boxes in your yard, some people remove those um, in the wintertime, but I always leave mine for shelter because in January, when the bluebird start coming back, the males start coming back, they all huddle together in those boxes for thermal protection at night, gives them extra warmth. So bluebirds and songbirds uh, will utilize your bird boxes for roosting when temperatures are extreme, especially in late January and February. Specially designed roosting boxes like the ones I show here are also a great option because they have less ventilation holes and are designed to maximize thermal protection. And you can find them on Amazon. Here is something that's a little bit new to me. I experimented with it a little bit last year. The English and the Europeans use these a lot. They're called bird roost pockets. And they, you know, like I said, I have limited experience with them, but I did try them last year. Um, I have mine tucked up underneath my grape arbor, um, and it provides chickadees and tip mice a little extra thermal protection when they when they need it. So I have the roost box or the roosting uh, pocket turned so we get prevailing westerly wind here, and the back of it is facing west, so the hole is facing east and gets the morning sun, and it does provide them a little bit of protection. And I've seen them going in and out of it, so I, I'm pretty sure they're using it. The disadvantage of these roost pockets is they're difficult to clean, and if we have anything like this on our properties, 
um, at any time. They need to be cleaned on a regular basis to keep the prevalence of disease down. You can find these ruse pockets. They're inexpensive, come in sets of three on Amazon, and you can also found, find them at Blaine's Farm and Fleet. I have actually seen them there. So I have this little video and let's hope it works. And it just kind of describes Roost Pockets and some of the benefits of them. Have you considered going solar in oh, Michigan, but a bit of the huge price tag attached? Most people don't know this, but almost 100% of- There we go. Oh, isn't it? A fabulous little <laughs> invention. <laughs> I like them. Um, they're wonderful. I mean, there's a, there's a great place there for a bird to spend the night or equally start a family in. They're not very big bird. It's surprising the amount of birds that might roost in there, especially on a cold winter's night, because they'll come in there to keep themselves warm with their own body heat. But birds like wrens will nest in these. And as you've seen at the front of the house, there, there's a, a family of wrens that have started nesting one of these little guys. You know what I like about them? They're tactile. No, you don't need any hammers. You don't need anything to put them up. You just go to your ivy and you go. That's very true. Oh, That's very true. It is, it, it's impossible to find a place, find something to, to hang with. They've got these little hooks on the back. Yeah. So I just pop it in. Just stick it in there. Stick it in. And then you can twist Same that little wire yeah. on the back, back round. Jobs are good. And I like and them. They look so far as well. Yeah. It does. They do look smashing. So you stick these two up? Yes. There you go. Wonderful. Jobs are good. Thank you. All right. So that is Bruce Pockets, kind of a neat little thing you might want to try in your yard, especially if you've got ivy, because they showed how easy it is to stick them in there. All right, so we need to make the most of the shelter that we give birds, and there's a few ways you can do that. So if you have um, nesting boxes and even how you place your feeders, here's some things you need to consider. Uh, position your shelters facing south to take advantage of the solar heating from the winter sun. And, you know, um, that now that we've passed Christmas, we gain daylight every day and it, things are getting a little bit warmer as we go along. It doesn't feel like it, but it's true. So hopefully February will be sunnier than January was. So if you have feeders and if you have houses out it's not too late to move them you can you can change their positioning um, you can paint your roost boxes or bird houses a dark color to absorb the heat and neutral tones also are a benefit because they you know grays and greens and browns can camouflage the house so it's less visible to predators you can position your brush piles your roost boxes and winter bird houses in the areas that are sheltered from the wind and the snow and you can provide insulating material in the bottom of any birdhouses you have this time of year. Add wood chips, dry grass, nesting materials, because those things will plug the cracks and holes and it will help the birds retain more body heat. And I believe with that, we are going to go to a break. And I will stop sharing and Shana is going to come back on, I think, and tell us what the plan is. There you are. Here we are. All right, let's see. It's 9.53. Let's meet back at, how about give us 10 minutes? So like 10.03-ish. Put that in the Q&A. Does that sound good, Elizabeth and Holly? Yes, sounds great. Oh, good. So 10.03. We'll see you back here. Hey, Shana. Yeah. Can you enable my screen sharing? It looks like I can't share my screen. Okay, let's currently. see. Hold on. Is my uh, audio bad? Nope. Okay. Was Elizabeth choppy for you on your end? 
a little bit when she played the video, but otherwise it was good. Okay, because it was, okay. Participants, let's see. Um, here you are, Miss Holly. Change role. Chat, stop. How do we do this before? Change role to attendee, that's not right. Allow to record, allow to change panelist appearance. It's not giving me an option. Um, hold on. Hey, Elizabeth, usually, you're muted. I don't have, I don't see where I can do it on my end. Change panelist appearance. That's not what I want. It does not show me that I can elevate you. That's oh. going to be a problem. Well, she can. No, because she's, remember, oh. we did this when we did the. How did we do it before? <laughs> White. No. It was just like you right clicked on those three little dots. Yeah. You chat, stop, video, pin, spotlight, change role to attendee. I wonder if I put you as an attendee, maybe I can bring you back. Do you want to try that? Sure. Oh, no. Here we go. Where is it? It's the arrow on share screen. Hit the arrow on your share screen. Yeah. And then click it says one panelist can share at a time, but then there's advanced sharing options at the bottom. Check that. Either that or click multiple panelists and see if she can come up. Okay. I see now that I can share. You can? can. Oh, perfect. Yay. I didn't Mine, it, am I coming through with good audio? Because it's very choppy on my end. You do once in a while, it breaks up as you're finishing a sentence, but it's, it's not, it's not, it's fine. I mean, it, it works. All right. We said 10.03. Um, what time is it? Oh, 9.57. We got, got time. Are we going too fast, too slow? Mm, what? Um, this next section is kind of the bread and butter. Yeah, I don't think we're going too fast. Okay. And I am moderating the Q&A. Excuse me, my gosh. All right, I'm going to run to the bathroom. I'll be right back. Okay.
All right, we are back, everybody. And our next section will be on types of birds to offer birds, um, the top 10 bird foods. But before we get started, would anybody, does anybody have any questions they want to put in the Q&A? And between the three of us, we'll do our best to answer before we move ahead. Yeah, and I wanted to highlight a couple of the questions that were asked during um, Elizabeth's section. So some of you were asking about tent caterpillars. You know, they can be really unsightly and, and gypsy moths can be pretty destructive to trees. So there was a question about whether we should should or could spray those or whether we should leave those alone. So what do you think, Beth? Okay, so in my experience, and I have a significant amount of experience with gypsy moths because they were a real problem in the park for a while. Um, the, the, the thought that I think works best with gypsy moths and with a lot of these um, pest species is that if we, if we let their population climb to an almost unbearable point where we're about ready to lose our minds, um, that population will crash because there's only so much food available for them, right? And they've eaten it all and then they have no support and they crash it. And it's better to let that population completely crash and do that naturally, uh, especially if you care about the birds, because a lot of the types of pesticides and things they use to control those birds, uh, uh, control those caterpillars are very detrimental to birds. So um, we stopped spraying in the park uh, because of that. And we just let that population rise and crash. And then we didn't have any problems with them for quite a long time again. So I guess it's based on what your threshold of comfort is, <laughs> what your level of patience is with that. But if you care about your birds, you're going to keep that spraying to a minimum. Yeah, and I mentioned there are some birds that really enjoy eating them, like yellow-billed and black-billed cuckoos. You'll see population spikes in those species, like when the tent caterpillar population is higher when gypsy moth um, populations are high. So um, it's a, it can be a beneficial time for birds when there's a lot of caterpillars around. Um, there was another question earlier about the roost boxes and they're quite large. And so someone was asking like, how many birds do you think could fit in there? And I would, I would think if it were like a starling sized bird, you might get eight to 12 maybe, but like a, a small bird, like a chickadee, maybe you could get as many as two dozen, I would think in there in a, in a box that big. What do you think, Beth? Yeah, I think, I think so. I'm thinking that the hole is an inch and three quarter. So that's going to limit some species that can get in there. Um, but yeah, certainly it's going to provide enough space for, you know, quite a few bird species, depending on their actual size. A bunch of uh, more than 12 chickadees can fit in there for sure. But it's not uncommon for birds to huddle together at night in, in any kind of sheltered space um, to get away from the wind. You know, those those shelters are critically important to them um, for survival when we're having harsh winter weather. All right. A couple more question. Um, this one is about bears. So um, what uh, would you ladies recommend for bears um, if they have problems with them? One person says um, they take the suet in at night when the bears are active. I mean, other things that I've read have talked about just making sure that they're out of reach and um, kind of putting them between or off of a wire between two stir either poles or a structure on one end and just, you know, doing that out of reach. I'd have to look up what the exact, you know, height is, but um, Elizabeth or Holly, do you have anything to add to that? I think this is Holly's question. Yeah, I, I would say really your best strategy, like for feeding bears is to, well, not for feeding bears, <laughs> for feeding right. birds is to feed them in the winter when bears are sleeping because bears will come to your feeders if they're very determined, they'll traverse some of those little wires and get to, <laughs> get, they're very resourceful and they'll, they'll get to things. So our advice that we usually give is take the bird feeders down when the bears are active, put them back up when the bears are hibernating. 
It can be tricky in times like this because we are having an unusually warm winter. And bears, if there are warm days, they will wake up and roam around. Um, they don't, they're not true hibernators. They're not going to sleep all year round. So, uh, or all winter long. So um, your best bet is to keep bird feeders up in the, in the winter time, take them down in the spring when bears are active. Great. All right. Next question. Um, recommendations for minimizing rodent traffic from the feeders and or feeding debris. So um, how are we going to do that? Holly, do you have a Elizabeth? Well, uh, you know, I like to see those things, but, and I have enough predators around, they take care of it. So I don't, I don't, by feeding birds, I'm not increasing, I don't think, uh, the level of rodent population to the point where they're going to be a nuisance, because fortunately I have the predators to take care of them. Um, but, you know, I, I do want to say this, and I kind of wanted to say it when Shane, or Shana was showing the picture of the hawk coming to your bird feeding area. I learned very long ago when I was a young naturalist just starting out in my career, there was a famous local regional naturalist who was an author and she did a lot of public speaking and she was on our board at the visitor center and I was complaining about this hawk that kept swooping through our bird feeding area at the visitor center and taking out goldfinches right in front of the visitors you know blood splash in the window and I was complaining about it and she overheard me and she reminded me that when you set the table for dinner out in the open you cannot be choosy about who comes to dinner it's open invitation. So sometimes you're going to get things coming to your feeder that maybe you didn't intend to attract. But, you know, we have to keep an open mind about all of that because it is available food and anything that is needing it is going to utilize it. So I'll let, let Holly pipe in there on the rest. Yeah. I think that's true. There's a certain amount of tolerance that you need to have for some of those creatures. But um, one thing that you can do to mitigate is to rake underneath your bird feeders, you know, in the evening before you head to bed. Um, and that'll get some of the spilled seed up and it'll be less attractive to those rodents that might come to your feeders. So I see some... Um, questions in here about like bigger birds crowding out smaller birds and nuisance birds at the feeder. And we are going to cover that just a little bit later in the presentation. So I would advise that we move on and, and we'll cover those a little bit later. Okay. All right. Take it away, Holly. All right. So this part of the presentation is really kind of the the meat of what we're here for today. So understanding which types of feeders to set up on your property and which types of foods are really gonna be attractive to the birds that are coming to your yard. Um, as we talked about before, of course, bird feeding is a beneficial activity for birds and, and for people as well. And it's really fun to foster that connection with the wildlife in your yard. So, um, you know, if you're just getting started bird feeding or if you've been frustrated with a lack of success in attracting birds to your yard, um, really the first thing you need to determine is whether you're feeding the right feeds and whether your um, bird feeder setup is attractive to birds. And we'll talk about, you know, how to set up your bird feeding station a little bit later. Um, but if, if you're not giving the birds the foods that they want, you might not have very many birds. Makes lots of sense, right? So we're going to look at some of the, the top most popular items to add to your, your bird feeding menu. We're going to start with a favorite of many different kinds of birds, the black oil sunflower seed. So almost any bird that will visit a bird feeder is gonna be attracted to black oil sunflower seeds. The kernels have a really high fat content and they make a really great staple in the winter diet because they're calorie rich and have that high fat content. 
The outer shell of the black oil sunflower seed is thin and easy to crack, so many different types of birds can eat these seeds. Um, birds that can't crack the seeds themselves will scour the ground underneath the feeders looking for bits and pieces that have been dropped by other birds. Black oil sunflower seeds are really best for attracting, like I said, the widest variety of birds to your winter feeder. You'll see chickadees, nuthatches, finches, jays, cardinals, and many other birds uh, being attracted to those black oil sunflower seeds. Um, Grosbeaks too are really a big fan of uh, black oil sunflower seeds. And this winter we've had quite an eruption of evening grosbeaks around the state. They've been popping up, you know, in southern counties, they've been popping up in the Upper Peninsula, lots of different places um, around the state. It's been a really good year for evening grosbeaks. So if you offer black oil sunflower seeds on a, a platform or like a tray type feeder, there's a chance you might see some evening grosbeaks um, in your yard. My dad and mom live up in Interlochen and they had a single male that visited their feeders uh, a couple weeks ago, and it was just the highlight of the winter for them. They were thrilled to see it. Um, you might also choose to offer striped sunflower seeds, or how do I get this to go away? Can you see my, um, well, whatever. <laughs> um, striped sunflower seeds and sunflower chips can be a good thing to offer too. Um, striped sunflower seeds are really adored by grosbeaks, cardinals, jays, and other big build birds because that hull is a little bit tougher and the big build birds can crack through that hull um, a little bit easier. Hulled sunflower seeds or sunflower hearts provide a really nice no mess option, but you definitely need to keep these um, sunflower seeds, the, the hearts of the sunflower seed dry because they will spoil faster than the seeds that have the, the husk or the, the hull on them. You can also, if you'd like to, grow your own sunflowers. And this provides not only beauty in the summer months, but food for birds in the winter and the fall um, as the, the flowers are still standing. So that's an option if you have a little bit of land or a little patch where you want to plant some sunflowers. Um, you'll get lots of birds coming to those sunflower seeds, including cute little red-breasted nuthatches, chickadees, finches, and some other birds as well. Um, peanuts are great to feed birds like Elizabeth was talking about earlier. A lot of woodpeckers will come to peanuts. Um, blue jays love peanuts. They're uh, a high protein, high energy food that doesn't freeze. So they're great to offer in the winter time. Do make sure though that they're dry roasted and unsalted. You don't want um, that salt for the birds, it'll, it can make them sick. Make sure there's no added flavors or coatings. Don't offer like honey roasted peanuts or um, other peanuts like that. Whole peanuts can attract jays, woodpeckers, nuthatches, and titmice. But be forewarned that squirrels also like peanuts. So expect to have um, some squirrels visiting your peanut feeder as well. You can also, if you don't want squirrels kind of near the bird feeder, you can offer a stash of peanuts elsewhere in your yard just for the squirrels so you don't have them visiting the, the birds or <laughs> competing with the birds at the bird feeders. Shelled peanuts and peanut butter are also good to offer. Um, Shelled peanuts and peanut chips can attract smaller birds like chickadees and finches. A lot of times these whole peanuts or peanut chips are added to seed mixes or to suet. Um, peanut butter can be a good feeding option too. You can smear peanut butter like on the bark of a tree or you can offer it in a dish at your feeding station. Both crunchy and smooth peanut butter are gonna be a hit with birds. They like both. Definitely avoid peanut spreads that are high in sugar and also may have preservatives that aren't good for birds. You wanna look for peanut butters that have the fewest 
um, ingredients in them. So maybe like peanuts and a little bit of salt, um, just the most basic peanut butters you can find. Um, that that's going to be the best for birds. And and some bird store like bird feeding stores will offer special peanut butter that's good for birds with fewer additives for them. Um, suet, of course, is a popular choice. Uh, suet attracts insect eating birds like woodpeckers and nuthatches. Most suet is beef kidney fat, which is inexpensive, and it's available at meat counters if you want to render your own suet. You can also purchase, um, you know, processed cakes like this one here um, that includes seeds and nuts and sometimes fruits and things like that. Be careful if you do offer suet in hot weather. It can become rancid if it hasn't been specially processed. So use care when you're using suet in the summer. Uh, maybe only put it out for a day or two so it doesn't spoil in the hot weather. Thistle is a really great option, Niger thistle, for finches. So you'll see um, gold finches, red poles, pine siskins, house finches, birds like that coming to your, your thistle feeder. Um, it's a favorite food. It's a good oily seed that offers a lot of calories to birds, helping birds store fat that they need to keep warm throughout the winter season. This Niger seed is treated so it won't germinate if it's spilled on the ground, but the holes can get messy underneath feeders, so you may want to rake those up periodically throughout the winter. You'll see a lot of um, just black <laughs> under, your, under your feeders, especially if you have snow on the ground. Um, you can use a specialized mesh or sock feeder that can accommodate several birds, but consider using one um, like the one that's shown here that has a nice wide upper baffle that's going to keep the seed dry and minimize mold, mold and mildew that can get into your, your thistle seed. Um, squirrels and larger birds tend not to like Niger thistle as much as the smaller birds, so this is a good thing to offer if you have a lot of competition from, um, you know, house sparrows or European starlings at your feeder. Um, like I said, you know, be really mindful of the rancid or moldy properties of this seed if you're offering it in wet weather. You may want to change it out frequently. Um, a sure sign that the, the feed has, has gone off or isn't tasting good to birds anymore is when birds stop visiting this feeder. So it's time to throw away what you've been offering and maybe buy a new bag um, if you see that birds aren't coming to your feeder. Um, I should mention, <clears throat> if you're in an area like me where we've had a really warm winter, and we've had rain the last several days, um, you might not see a lot of birds coming to your feeder right now if you're in an area like this. And that's because there are other food sources available for them. It's been so unseasonably warm that there are some, some insects, some berries, some other natural food sources that birds are going to right now. Um, it's nice and warm so they can forage for seeds and things like that. There's no snow on the ground so they can get to the leaf litter and, and you know, paw through there looking for insects and things like that. So um, if you're not seeing a lot of birds at your feeder right now, it's probably because there's a lot of natural food sources available to them. If you're in a part of the state that just had a snowstorm over the last couple of days, you're going to see more birds at your feeder because the weather's a little bit more inclement than it is down here in our part of the state. So don't fret if you're not seeing birds right now. It's because there's other things that they're finding to eat. Safflower seeds. These are white, thin-shelled seed eaten by many birds. It's a favorite food of the northern cardinal, so if you really like getting cardinals to your bird feeders, this is a good seed to offer. Um, 
safflower seed may not be as readily eaten by squirrels, blackbirds, grackles, and starlings because it has kind of a bitter taste, but that doesn't bother the cardinals. <laughs> your results may vary though. You might see some of those um, species coming to your feeder anyway, if they've gotten used to the taste. Feed safflower in any feeder that can accommodate sunflower seed. Um, avoid offering safflower in wet weather because this is another seed that can spoil, become soggy, and really inedible to birds. Um, cracked corn is a great food to offer, especially if you have turkeys that hang out around your yard or um, waterfowl that comes up from a water body into your yard. So if you have uh, mallards or wood ducks that occasionally come to your feeders, offering cracked corn is a great thing to do. Um, this is dried field corn that's cracked into smaller bits, and this will attract sparrows, juncos, blackbirds, blue jays, doves, cardinals, turkeys, waterfowl, like I mentioned. It should be fed in moderation to birds. Um, it it can it can take up a lot of room in their their stomachs and it can uh, cause some ailments for birds. So offer offer it sparingly. Um, whole corn corn on the cob is not a good bird food for birds because the kernels are too big. They're too hard for most birds to uh, digest. But squirrels really love corn, uh, either cracked or whole. So you can offer, you know, corn cobs in another part of your yard for the squirrels to kind of draw them away from bird seed if you would like. Millet is a favorite food of many small ground feeding birds, including juncos, sparrows, and doves. It's inexpensive. It can be offered in hopper tube or platform feeders, or you can sprinkle it on the ground for birds to come to, to attract even more of those small birds. It's often a large component of bird seed mixes, but it's important not to confuse Milo, mi millet, with Milo. Um, millet is often this beautiful whitish colored seed. Milo is more of a, a reddish colored seed. Milo is not preferred by many birds in Michigan at all. There are some Western species that will eat Milo, but here in Michigan, if you're offering a food that has Milo, um, it's, it's really not gonna be eaten and it's usually just wasted and, and dumped on the ground. So try to get bird seed mixes that do not have Milo as it's just a filler that the birds actually aren't gonna eat. Mealworms are a great thing to offer to birds. Many different feeder birds will eat mealworms if you offer them. This is the larval stage of the mealworm beetle. And these mealworms can be purchased either live or freeze dried. You can use a shallow ceramic dish or a flat tray or even a special hanging feeder for mealworms to feed live mealworms or freeze dried mealworms. Bluebirds love mealworms, and you will see them coming to your mealworm feeder, especially in the, the winter and in the spring when they're feeding youngsters. Carolina wrens enjoy them quite a bit. Chickadees, nuthatches, and titmice are frequent visitors to mealworm feeders. And you can continue to feed these mealworms into the nesting season in spring. And like I said, they will use those to feed their youngsters, especially bluebirds. Fruits can be a really important thing to offer for birds. And um, not only can you offer fruits at feeders, but like Elizabeth alluded to earlier, you can plant some um, shrubs and trees that will retain their fruit into the winter. And that provides a really nice source of food for birds. So planting things like um, crab apples, hawthorns, um, mountain ash, um, what else? Shrubs like highbush cranberry, um, some elderberries, viburnum, uh, winterberry holly. These all have 
uh, fruits that usually persist on the, the plant into the winter and can provide an important winter food source for birds. Um, a lot of fruit eating birds do migrate south in the winter, but there are some that stay in snowy out, snowy areas year round and are going to enjoy the treat of fruit. You can offer chopped apples, orange wedges, banana slices, cranberries, raisins, have grapes and melon rinds on platform feeders or on special hooks that you can hook fruit onto. Fruits can also be added to suet and seed mixtures as well. If you do feed any dried fruits like raisins or other things like that, it should be fresh with no sugar added and no other additives um, and, and they should be offered in moderation. Mockingbirds, catbirds, bluebirds, robins, and waxwings are all species that are really attracted to fruit and are likely to come to your feeders. Um, mockingbirds and catbirds usually aren't around in the winter, but bluebirds, robins, and waxwings will come to fruit in the winter. Be sure to feed only what the birds in your area are likely to eat in a day or two so that you don't have spoilage occurring with the fruit. Um, throw away any fruit that becomes moldy so that we don't make birds sick. Um, and then, like I said, those natural food sources are really important for birds. So if you're considering, you know, re-landscaping your yard, um, look for those, fr those uh, fruits that those trees and shrubs that have a natural fruit on them that'll persist through the winter. Seed mixes. Good quality bird seed mixes are always gonna attract a wider variety of birds. Um, choose a mix that features large proportions of sunflower seeds and millet, but avoid mixes with large amounts of fillers such as wheat and milo and even corn. Some of the better mixes that you can purchase might even include like nuts and nut pieces and even dried fruits. And sometimes they look good enough to eat like that. That <laughs> one on the right, you just throw some uh, M&Ms in there and it looks like a tasty trail mix that you might enjoy. Um, you might wanna try different mixes to attract different types of birds and kind of change things up and see, see what kinds of birds you can attract to your yard. You can purchase specialty mixes to attract specific birds, or you can even buy bird seed in bulk and create your own mixes and customize them for your backyard flocks and what you might want to see at your feeder. So be sure to use high quality seeds and other high quality ingredients for the best results. So when you're storing your bird feed, you can store bird food for several months at a time as long as it's stored in a way that you know keeps the food covered and um, nice and dry and you don't have you know little critters getting into your your food so you might want to look for things like big galvanized cans if you're going to buy you know several many like large bags of sunflower seeds or um, other seed mixes those are really good to have on hand. Five gallon buckets also work really well as long as there's a lid that you can pop on there. And then I really like, because I um, have kind of a smaller bird feeding operation in my yard, I really like these uh, pitchers that have a little pour spout because it makes filling the feeders really, really easy and nice. So in the fall, a lot of garden centers and feed stores offer fresh supplies. So that can be a really good time to stock up on bird seed. And like I said, if you store it properly, the seed can last for many months, especially seed mixes and sunflower seeds. You wanna keep your seed in a nice, cool, dry place that's protected from bugs, from rodents, from raccoons, and other critters that might wanna enjoy your seeds. Um, you'll use more seed than you might realize each winter. You'll be glad to have a little extra storage. Having good, good bins is a, a good way to keep that seed fresh. And then you may want to have a large scoop or a funnel on hand to easily fill your feeders um, with that seed. 
When you do purchase new seed, make sure that you don't mix the new supply in with the old. You're going to want to um, avoid feeding stale seeds. So use up what you have first and then dump the new supply in there or um, put the, the old seeds on top and the new seeds on the bottom. Um, you can keep smaller quantities of bird seed in the freezer to keep it fresher. That's a good idea for um, Niger thistle. Goldfinches will not eat stale seed or yucky moldy wet seed. So that can be an option for you to keep that Niger thistle a little bit longer, keep it fresher longer. In the summertime, there are different rules for feeding the birds. So once that weather warms up, it's time to really put away the things that are going to easily spoil. There's lots of natural food sources available, um, so you don't need to offer quite as much in the summertime. You definitely want to avoid soft suet, suet blends, and peanut butter in the summer because it can spoil pretty quickly in warm weather. Seeds might spoil more quickly in rain and humidity, so if you're having a long stretch of rainy weather, you might want to take some of those seeds down, especially, you know, the, the hulled sunflower seeds, the safflower, the niger thistle. Um, finches are going to come to those niger feeders all year, but remember to use like a wide baffle type feeder to keep that seed dry and check it regularly to make sure it hasn't gone stale or moldy. Um, nectar feeders are great to offer for hummingbirds and sometimes even woodpeckers and, and other birds will come to those feeders as well. Orioles like some of those nectar feeders. With those, again, be sure to change the feed regularly so you don't have that sugar water sitting out for multiple days. That can spoil as well. You want to change those feeders daily or every other day at the most. Feeders with oranges or natural grape jelly are going to attract Orioles, catbirds, grosbeaks, and maybe some others. So that's a good thing to offer, especially in May when migration is really ramping up for those birds. They're going to be hungry <laughs> when they get to your feeder. So having those oranges, that grape jelly can be really good for attracting Orioles and those colorful rose-breasted grosbeaks that we love so much. And then many nesting birds are going to visit mealworm feeders to find an easy food source that they can bring back to their youngsters in the nest. You can get a little creative and make your own bird feeding treats. Um, there will be some recipes in the, the packet that you get in the mail with your book. Um, so those are heading your way. You can make things like pine cone bird feeders. These are really simple to make and fun to make with kids. It can be a little bit messy, but it, they're really fun to make and hang up. You just take some peanut butter or some shortening if you have peanut butter allergies with the kids in your household. And you can just coat the pine cone with that peanut butter or that shortening and then roll it in seed and hang it up outside for the birds to enjoy. You can make your own bark butter, which is like a similar to a peanut butter that you would spread on trees or in specialized feeders to feed the birds. You can make balls of suet, cubes of suet. Um, you can make birdseed cookies. Uh, there's just lots of really fun things you can do. And you can make your own feeders with natural food sources too. Like if you have pie pumpkins left over from uh, or squash left over from Thanksgiving, or if you have orange rinds or apples, you can make feeders out of those too. So like I said, those instructions will be in the packets that you get. Now there are some things that you should never ever feed to birds. We've talked a lot about spoiled seed or spoiled nectar that can have mold or bacteria that can be really harmful for birds. You don't want to feed any table scraps to them. You know, they could have been prepared with oil or spices that might be harmful to birds. Table scraps can also attract rats, raccoons, possums, and other things that you don't necessarily want in your yard. Um, never offer rotten food. Again, that bacteria and mold is going to impact the birds. 
Don't offer junk food, you know, that has no nutritional value. It can have processed chemicals. I know some people that put out like cheesy poofs for some of the J's, that's not a good thing to offer. <laughs> um, chocolate can be toxic. Make sure that you don't have chocolate in any of your seed mixes. Don't offer chocolate to birds. Salt can upset the electrolyte and fluid balance in birds, especially in really tiny birds, and that can be toxic. Um, don't offer meat. Meat can spoil quickly and it can attract cats and rats and foxes and coyotes and other things you don't want around your feeders. Bread. Don't feed birds bread, not even the ducks at the park. <laughs> it has no nutritional value. It's too filling. It leaves little room for the foods that they need to remain healthy. So if you are going to feed birds at the park, which we don't recommend, um, but if you do, use a cracked corn or a bird seed mix for those birds. Never feed milk. That can cause diarrhea and you don't want to feed honey either. Honey can harbor bacteria and mold that can be fatal to birds. This list is included in your handout that you're going to get in the mail. Um, so don't worry about writing everything down. That's going to be in there as well. Um, and you can find different recipes online too that include some of these items. Um, don't use those recipes that have some of the items in this list. Never use those. All right. So now that we know what to feed birds and what not to feed them, Elizabeth is going to cover different types of bird feeders and how to maintain them. I think, uh, Shana, you have some yeah. questions. Yeah. Questions? yeah. Okay. Um, we have a lot of great questions, Holly, and I wanted to kind of wait till you were done to get some of your thoughts on them as you're our expert on um, all things bird food and a couple other types of questions. So um, there were a couple questions about bird feeder types, which Elizabeth will get to, the weight and trip feeder and some other things. So yes, we will address those. Um, as far as food, what do you have to say about capsaicin? So I know it's not recommended for birds, but what are your thoughts on that? Or what do you know about that for birds? Mm -hmm. Good question. Um, the jury is still kind of out on capsaicin, whether it's um, good for birds or potentially harmful. And so the Cornell Lab of Ornithology actually cautions people not to use them. So capsaicin is... Um, like a hot pepper taste that's supposed to not impact birds, but it tastes bad to mammals. So squirrels won't eat bird seeds or suet that's made with capsaicin. Um, but again, it's it's not highly recommended by bird experts just because we don't know the long-term impact that it could potentially have on birds. Okay, thank you. Um, deer. We've got one of our participants who's been having problems with deer coming to their her feeders overnight. Um, she's using hang it, hanging basket poles, um, but the deer love that height. And she said it's hard for her to use like a, a taller ladder. So I don't know if maybe a, a pole with a hook, those kinds of things, I guess. What would you talk about deer and coming to feeders too and what the kind of the risks with that? Mm -hmm. We're going to cover this even a little bit more later, but... Um, there is actually a prohibition on recreational feeding of deer in the whole lower peninsula of Michigan. And that's because of some deer diseases that we have, um, chronic wasting disease and bovine tuberculosis that we're trying to keep from spreading around the state. So um, whenever possible, it is a good idea to fence around your feeding stations to try and keep the deer out. So some sort of structure that's going to keep the deer from getting close enough to your feeder. Um, it can be a challenge to hang feeders high enough to keep deer away because they can reach, you know, by standing on their back feet, they can reach, you know, seven, eight feet. And um, when they're determined, they can <laughs> they can really <laughs> try to get into feeders. So I would recommend um, some sort of fence around your feeding structure. 
Um, I, I'd like to I, I'd like to add to that. Okay, sorry for interrupting. Um, so I have some experience with this because, and I'm sure when Holly mentioned the word fence, some of you are thinking, oh, cha-ching, cha-ching, because fences can be expensive. And deer can jump. So sometimes it's not even effective. But uh, what we did at the visitor center when the height of our concern over chronic wasting disease was at, was at its peak, we actually installed a electric wire um, on the part so, you know, the visitor center, is, you envision a big building and we're on the edge of a dune and the woods is behind the feeding area. So we ran the wire around the back side because if the deer are, were going to visit our particular station, that's the direction they were coming from. So we put the wire there about chest height and it kept them out. Most animals sense that electric current and they, it stops them in their tracks. Um, or they'll bump into it and it just, you know, it, it disturbs them so that they take off. Um, you're probably thinking electric wire. Oh, that could be expensive. No, they're actually really cheap. You know, we had, we had horses for years. And so uh, at our other farm, we used electric fencing that we just bought a tractor supply. We had, we had a little solar box. We didn't even have to hook it up to any kind of electric source. We used the solar box to activate that and keep that live wire going so our horse wouldn't escape. So I don't know. That's just some thoughts that I had on that. If you want to go a less expensive route, if it's possible for you to do that. Of course, that doesn't work with kids because you don't want them touching the wire. It's just, it's just a shock. It's not going to, you know, do long-term damage, but it's still, <laughs> it, it, it's still, you know, it still smarts and hurts. So anyway we yeah we had a suggestion here from one of the participants about bringing the feeders in at night if that's where your problem is um bringing those in at night and after a few days uh, for her they stopped coming so that would be another option and then we had a suggestion um about not using a ladder rope and pulley system if you needed to get it up high enough so you wouldn't have to use the ladder so those would be other things to to consider as well um so elizabeth you're going to talk about you know, squirrels and feeders and, and all of that. So I won't get into those questions just yet. Um, we had a question about using a sun butter, so like a peanut butter alternative. And Elizabeth and I kind of thought, well, if it's pure and it doesn't have a lot of preservatives, that that would be reasonable. Would you agree with that, Holly? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. So a uh, peanut butter alternative would be okay. And then mealworms and how to keep them alive, I think was the question. Um, somebody bought them and killed them with an in a day, I think they were referring to the mealworms. So I don't have experience with mealworms. Do you, Holly, as far as um, keeping them alive and how to go about that? I don't have a lot of experience because I don't offer them myself. We don't have bluebirds <laughs> around my neighborhood. Lots of house sparrows, but no bluebirds. Um, so I would say it's probably not a terrible thing if they're dead in the feeder because birds are still going to come and eat them just like they would a freeze-dried mealworm. Um, so I'm not a hundred percent sure <laughs> on that one. I'll have to look it up. Yeah, we might need to do a little research on that. Yeah. Okay. I think I got to everything, um, except for the feeders and, and keeping varmints away that we don't want, which Elizabeth, you'll address in your, um, next session. So Elizabeth, take it away. Okay. I'm going to share my screen here. Oh, and I don't have my screen. Okay, what's going on? Hold on. Get you guys back here. Um, what is going on? Ah, there we go. Little changes in Zoom caught me off guard. Sorry about that. So we're going to talk about feeder types and what birds use them. Uh, Let's start with the uh, platform or tray feeders. Um, these are easy to make if you have somebody in your family that likes to do woodworking and has scrap wood, you can make one very easily. You can also buy them at any types of stores that provide um, seed. They usually have an, ar uh, an array of different types of feeders also available for sale. Um, well, so the, the birds that are most likely to use your platform feeders, you know, are your doves, um, 
whether the platform feeder is on the ground, uh, you know, if it's on the ground, you might get turkeys, pheasants, you know, some of the game birds actually might end up coming if your platform feeder is one of those types that is mounted on the ground. The disadvantage of tray and platform feeders is that they are exposed. So whether they're elevated or mounted near the ground, they're being exposed to the elements and you ha can have a problem with um, moisture buildup and the seeds becoming moldy and bacterial growth, which is very, very bad for the birds. So if you're going to choose this type of feeder, you have to make the commitment to monitor it regularly to make sure that no mold or um, moisture is building up in that feeder. Another problem with platform and tray feeders is the buildup of droppings, which can contaminate um, the seed and making it an unhealthy shared space. Um, these feeders, you know, like I said, have to be cleaned much more often and they pose many cleaning challenges because of the nooks and crannies in them in those corners. Um, but this type of feeder will attract a variety of birds. You know, it's attractive to sparrows, doves, as I mentioned, and most of the other songbirds will use them. I mean, we had them at the visitor center for years. We had some elevated ones and, you know, jays would get in there, cardinals would use it, the chickadees, tip mice, all of the different birds that came to our feeding area liked them. Juncos, probably not so much because they tend to stay closer to the ground if your platform feeder is elevated. So hopper feeders um, are an option too. Oh, I'm just looking, sorry. I had a little break in my thought process here because Shana sent me a note, but I think we're, I think we're okay with it. But the hopper feeder, um, th those are completely enclosed. So that's an advantage because it can protect the seed um, with the exception of those that have the tray at the bottom. Um, they can keep seed dry if the roof overhangs far enough um, and the feeder is well maintained. A variety of birds will use hopper feeders, including the cardinals, chickadees, nuthatches, tufted titmice, grosbeaks, and jays. Uh, some hoppers are designed with a perch that is sensitive to weight. Now, I know we had a question about that. What do someone asked, What do we think about those? I think they're great feeders. In fact, the only kind I buy is the hopper feeder with the weighted perch. <laughs> Because I don't want the squirrel to get all of the seed. And so the minute a squirrel goes up there, even a red squirrel, it weighs too much and it makes that perch drop and it causes the, um, the gate to close and no more seed will be dispensed. So it cuts them off. Even some of the larger birds like pileated woodpeckers, which I'm sure you would love having at your feeder station, but... It, you know, they weigh too much. So it will close, it will close that hopper and um, exclude them, which is okay if you have other types of feeders out there. Um, the main thing is if you're having problems with squirrels, consider a hopper feeder that has the weighted perch, because that's gonna that's gonna really deter them. Someone also asked about other ways to keep squirrels out of your feeders, and you can do that by greasing the pole. You can also use a slinky mounted on the pole so that when they climb it, they grab that slinky, it pulls it down, and then they can't, they can't get up. Uh, you can use all kinds of baffles, and those are readily available. And you can buy them on Amazon. You don't, have, you don't even have to leave your house. You can find baffles on Amazon. So there are alternatives out there for your poles to kind of deter squirrels. Squirrels can be a real problem in some areas. You know, it depends on your outlook. Some people really enjoy watching the squirrels. But they can eat a lot of seed, which can get costly. Okay, window feeders. Now, uh, these will not be used by all birds. But some of the benefits of this feeder style are so hard to resist. Uh, these are great for kids. You know, if you have grandchildren and they're getting into bird watching with you, if you have one of these window feeders, it'll get them really excited because the birds are right there. So um, first, these feeders provide clarity and the opportunity to view birds within a very close range. And they are easy to clean and they discourage predators because very few predators are going to scale your window to get up into that feeder. So there are lots of popular 
um, designs uh, available. And here's just a few of them and they're readily available at feed stores. And of course on Amazon, even some of the Hallmark stores carry these because they're kind of a neat gift for people to give other um, friends and family. So tube feeders, tube, um, tube bird feeders are usually made of a clear plastic tube and can have either plastic or metal caps, bases, and perches. The advantage of a tube feeder is they keep the bird seed clean and dry. They also discourage larger birds like grackles. So if you're having problems with starlings and grackles, try the tube feeders. Um, those with the metal feeding ports are probably the best choices if you have high squirrel traffic because squirrels will chew plastic, they'll eat it up, and they'll chew up and destroy a tube feeder in just several weeks. So you want to be sure that if you've got a lot of squirrels in your area, use the ones with the metal accent points, the port feeders, the perches, the bases, um, use the ones that have the metal. And there's a lot of them out there. You can even buy them at Meyer. Meyer had quite a big selection here at the um, at Christmas time. Um, so tube feeders come in a variety of shape, uh, sizes. You know, um, some have roofs over them for extra protection and trays at the bottom. Finches and chickadees are especially attracted to tube feeders. Goldfinches like them. Uh, you can buy these tube feeders that have the smaller ports for your niger seed, which of course is going to be attractive to the goldfinches. Um, so, but you know, nuthatches, titmice, and other songbirds will come and use these feeders as well. Now we've talked quite a bit about suet feeders. They come, there's a variety of suet feeders out there. And the one thing I want to emphasize about suet feeders is you can buy some pretty fancy ones. The Duncraft Company makes some that are pretty elaborate, can be quite pricey. Um, the suet mounts in the bottom, like the picture on the lower right there. And, you know, it, it makes it really great. You can really view the bird and all that. But you don't have to spend that kind of money on a suet feeder. Something as simple as a bag um, that your oranges came in, if you cut it at the top and save that um, mesh bag, you can fill it with suet from the butcher and just hang it from a hook. And it works great as a suet feeder. So you don't really have to do anything too fancy. You can come up with some different ideas. I had intended to show you one that I had made and I am I searched for it during the break and can't find it. I don't know what happened to it. The, the new kitten I have probably grabbed it and took it somewhere. But what you can do is you can take a little log, just something about the yay big around, and you can take a short section of it, put um, an eye hook at the top, and just have someone or yourself drill holes in it that you can then stuff with the suet and hang outside. So that's an easy fix just for materials around your house. One of the things that um, I like to do here uh, is have the wire cage. These are not expensive. This picture here in the middle with the uh, red belly woodpecker on it. Um, I use that type here at my house, but I find that I have to zip tie the door closed so that the squirrels, you know, they figure it out that they can't get their nails underneath there and lift that lid to take the suet out. And it also discourages other animals like possums and raccoons at nighttime. So there's lots of options out there with suet and you will attract your greatest variety of birds to your feeding area if you provide suet. Again, to emphasize, Holly mentioned it, but you don't wanna leave suet out when the temperature rises. I, my general rule at my house is I don't put it out if it's more than 40 some degrees. So as we're approaching that 50 mark, the suet comes down here at my house. We don't leave it up. Oh, one last thing I want to say. One of the things we did at Hoffmaster when I first started working there is around our bird pond, we had a lot of big old tree stumps. And they had all kinds of cracks and crevices in them. And so we used to take the suet that we would buy from the butcher 
in those days, you could just go in and get it for a quarter, you know. Um, we would stuff it into the cracks and crevices of the logs and the stumps that were sitting around the bird feeding area. And it provided a great place for the birds to come down and perch as they were gathering seeds. And then the suet eating birds were, would be able to hang on to that bark on the old stump and then access the suet. And it was a really great way to display and put suet out without having to spend any money at all. All right, mealworm feeders. Um, Holly talked quite a lot about mealworms. Um, I don't know any tricks for keeping them alive if you choose to um, put live ones out, um, but you can buy them freeze dried. And I mean, I think you can even buy them on Amazon. I mean, Amazon has everything now. I, I have a box turtle that I keep at the visitor center. I was even able to get him some, some new foods on Amazon, like freeze dried chicken hearts, and he loves them. So just, you know, they, they have a lot of freeze dried foods on Amazon. Check it out. You might find, find uh, freeze dried mealworms on there and you won't have to run around town searching for where you can find them. But they have special types of mealworm feeders that you can buy. Duncraft makes the fancy one where two, the male and the female can sit and eat at the same time. Those are neat, but you don't have to spend a lot of money either. You can just use some kind of tray or dish from your own home that you mount out there. Just make sure you're keeping it clean. Again, anything that's exposed is going to get build moisture and mold is going to grow, especially here in Michigan. So mealworms have so many benefits to birds of all kinds. They are the perfect balance of protein, fat, and fiber. And they, and they, you know, the, the actual worm itself is not going to really spoil. And they, like Holly said, whether they die or not, the birds are going to eat them. And uh, they really appeal to a bird's natural foraging insect instincts. So I've thought about this next year using them at my house and figuring out some kind of feeder arrangement because I have bluebirds all around us here. We see them all the time. But they don't, um, we don't have the right habitat in the yard for their nesting because we have too many trees. We have some openings in an old pasture, but it's just not quite right for them. And the wrens give them a hard time. So I think if we offered a feeder, though, they would come in to feed and we'd have a better opportunity to view them and enjoy their, their beautiful color in the spring. Peanut feeders, I talked about those before, you know, when we were preparing for this program a year ago, we, we've done this multiple times, um, I said to my husband, you know, we, we don't have a peanut feeder, gosh, I think we could get more of the pileated woodpeckers come out of the woods if we had the peanut feeder, and it was true, because Chris went out in the wood shop and he made me this peanut feeder over here on the right hand side, it just has a little thin wood top and base, and it's just basically some old chicken wire uh, wire material that he had that he wrapped around that. And it's easily fill, filled with peanuts, unsalted, of course, roasted, unsalted. And uh, it's been wonderful. The jays, the woodpeckers get in there. Of course, Mr. Squirrel occasionally gets his fill too. But um, yeah, peanut feeders can be a great addition to your bird feeding station, especially if you're looking to attract a greater variety of birds. Nuthatches particularly like um, peanuts as do the woodpeckers. Now, you don't have to buy a feeder to have, an ex have a successful bird feeding station. I often tell people, if you are not somebody that likes cleaning your bird feeder, then you should just make your own. Because if you collect recyclables, there are lots of different designs that you can use to create your own feeder. And then when it's dirty, every couple of weeks, you toss it out and pull out another one. So it's a great way and it's a great alternative. And it's also a way to get children involved in contributing to the bird feeding station because they can make the feeder themselves. I have this one here made from a milk carton and my daughter Mara, of course, the artist painted it so that it would look cute. She painted it like a blue jay, it has little wings here where the birds can go in and get the seed. And these are wonderful. And like I said, when it gets dirty, you throw it out and you start over. 
And there's a lot of materials around your house that you can use, a soda bottle. And look at this great picture here on the left with a soda bottle, holes poked in it, and then they just stuck a wooden spoon in there for a perch. What a brilliant idea. You can use pine cones, you can use mason jars, or you can get a little more fancy if you have a woodworker at home and they can build you something out of some of the wood that's left over from another project. So there's many, many options, and there's an endless number of ideas on Pinterest, if you are a Pinterest follower. All right, so as we talked about before, it's critically important to keep your bird feeders clean. And I have this little video, which I always say I'm going to redo, and I never do, but I'm going to show this. And, hey, Elizabeth. Yeah. Hey, before you get into this section, we've got yeah. some great a few questions so go ahead, go ahead. yeah so one of the questions was about um the mealworms and whether or not um they have more water content that's good for or the water content is really good for young birds so we know that they're a great all-around food source with the fiber and the protein i didn't know about any sort of you know extra water for the younger birds do you have a do you know no. No, I would think a caterpillar would have more water content. If you've ever held a mealworm, they're pretty they're pretty hard. Dense. I don't I don't know. Maybe Holly has something to say about that, but um I don't I don't and I have never read that their water content is higher than any other type of worm or caterpillar that's available. Just that we know they're a great food source. So they're great food okay. source. I would think that live would be slightly better than freeze dried for yeah. that the water for the young. Mm -hmm. Okay, was well, there any other questions? Yeah, so we're gonna discuss frequency of cleaning feeders in a moment. So there was a, a question about whether hopper feeders were different than other feeders, but I know you're gonna address that. Mm -hmm. um, the bottom of a platform feeder, um, you know, putting holes, like kind of weeping holes that would allow some of that moisture to drain out. I mean, um, you know, I would say that 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 might help, but that really it's still sitting together and getting moist. But do you have any sense of what that might do if that's a great idea? You can put C poles in there, but you have to remember it's not going to really address the fecal content buildup. I mean, it's still that's still going to be a problem. And wood is porous. So the surface, you know, if you're if you're just going in there with a little brush and you're ch -ch -ch, just brushing it out, you're still going to have bacterial buildup because of the wood. Surf. If it's if it's a wood platform feeder, it's you know you're still going to get bacteria in those cracks and crevices. So I'm going to talk about the materials yeah. you can use to you know clean your feeder. And then this was our, our last question was about using the window feeders and then the potential for window strikes. And and I, my feeling was yeah, it's going to increase that potential so you might need to do some things to you know uh, to maybe put some decals on or paint the feeder in some way so it can break up that reflection do you have anything more to add to that i do uh so cornell lab of ornithology has a great guide for people um to reduce your window strikes and i have utilized it for the visitor center because we have those giant windows that face north so when birds are flying south um, in the fall, we were having a real problem with window strikes. So Cornell recommends that you angle your feeders. You know, when you have a big window, you want your feeders right in front of it because you want to be able to get the best view. But Cornell says they need to be on a 45, I think it's a 45 degree angle. Um, maybe it's more, but the information is on there. If you cruise through their website, you'll find tips and tricks to reduce your window strikes. And really it's the placement of your feeders that makes the biggest difference. And I can attest to that because once we angled those feeders to the corners of the viewing station, we don't get the window strikes anymore. Okay. All right. Um, Elizabeth, do you want to take a break before we get into feeders here? It's 11.07. We're going to take a break, or do you want to push through, and then we'll take a break after? Let's push through and take a break after. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Let's watch this. See if I can... Drinking ice water flushes oh one pound of belly fat every day. People are... There we go. Hi, everyone. I'm Elizabeth Tillman from Michigan DNR. 
I'm coming to you today from my own backyard. How many of you feed birds in your backyard like I do? How many of you clean your feeders once a month? Oh, it's my responsibility to keep my feeders clean to protect the birds that I love. So the first thing you got to do is get a rake and rake away the old seed, seed hog from into your feed. Get them out of the way, scatter them into a base behind the feeder, and just clean that area up as best you can. Next comes the washing of the actual feeder. And this may require taking the feeder apart like I've done with this one here. Mm -hmm. So when you start to wash your feeder, we recommend you wear gloves. Now, rubber gloves, uh, dish gloves are still available in the stores, or you can use a pair of washable work gloves. And you're gonna wanna put your feeder after you've taken the different parts apart uh, and shook, shook out all the old seed and res as much residue as you can. You're gonna wanna put that feeder in a bucket or a solution of antibacterial soap and water. Hot water works good. Get it in there, let it soak for about 10 minutes. Once the feeder is soaked, you can take a variety of different types of brushes, bottle brushes work good, and try to scrub and get those tight places in there. Another tool that works really well is an old toothbrush. It's always great to have a few of these around. Take your old toothbrush and then you can get in those really tight corners to clean that up. Now, be sure you throw away that old toothbrush when you're done, because nobody wants to use that again. Okay, so once your feeder has gotten scrubbed, then you're going to put it into a solution of bleach. Now, you're going to want to use hot water for your bleach solution, and you're going to want to be careful with the bleach because it can stain your clothes. But if you use a ratio of one part bleach to nine parts water, that will disinfect your bird feeder, getting rid of all the bacteria and viruses that can build up from multiple birds visiting the feeder. So you're gonna soak it for 10 minutes in that bleach solution. Now the one part bleach to nine parts water, often people ask me, well, what does that mean? Well, what it means is, for instance, one cup measurement of bleach and the nine parts would be nine cups of water. Now you can use a variety of other measuring tools, but that gives you an idea of what that means. So once your feeder has soaked in the bleach solution for 10 minutes, then you're going to want to rinse it thoroughly. And we're going to go over here to the hose. And we are going to rinse it. Now, a good rule is to rinse it for 10 minutes. You're just going to want to thoroughly get in there, all the places, and get that bleach rinsed out. Now, once that feeder has been thoroughly rinsed, you can set it in a sunny place and let the sun dry it. Okay. Let that feeder dry in the sun thoroughly. And then once it is thoroughly dry, you can refill it with seed and put it in your bird feeding area. Okay, everyone, we recommend you clean those feeders once a month. And while you're home, practicing social distancing is a great time to get your feeders clean. So let's all get a little spring cleaning done, everyone. Okay. So that's the basics of um, that's the basics of cleaning your feeders. I would like to add a couple of things there that people often ask me when they take their feeder down to clean it, particularly in the winter. They're concerned about leaving the birds high and dry, no food. If you have multiple feeders, then you can rotate the cleaning process. Um, if you just have one feeder up and it's necessary to take it down and clean it, um, do so and don't worry about the two days it might take for it to thoroughly dry because it's not summer and you don't have sun. It doesn't matter. The birds will disperse. There's lots of natural foods available. The only time that wouldn't be the case is if we were having a blizzard and it's late February when most of the natural foods have already been eaten. So you should not have any troubles taking that feeder down for several days at a time. In fact, at the visitor center, we routinely do that so that the birds disperse and we're getting the disease that may have been building up in those um, in the droppings that are, you know, contaminating the seed. Um, 
it's just a good idea to get everybody to go to their own place and move out and not be bunched up in those groups where they're transmitting disease to each other. So um, it's something that people do and feel concerned about, but you, you, it's, it's an unnecessary fear because um, it's good to disperse the birds and not have them all together all the time. And I believe that that's it and we are up for a break. Elizabeth, before yes. we go on a break, um, I've got a couple of quick questions. Sure. Rinsing your feeders um, when you're cleaning them, you said 10 minutes. Yeah. Is that in just a clean bath of water or actually rinsing? I would, I, would rinse, like active... I would rinse it with the hose. For 10 minutes? Yeah, I would, because you want to get all the bleach residue out of it. Okay. okay. I mean, if that's too long for you, do it for five and then stick it in a bucket of stick it in a big clean basin of water and let it soak for a few minutes and then okay. take it out. And then um, did you uh I don't think you mentioned bleach turning plastics yellow? Oh well I su I suppose if it's a feeder you've had it for a long time and you routinely clean it, it could bleach could turn it. Um, you can use Dawn dish detergent, antibacterial dish detergent, but it's that bleach kills those things that the Dawn isn't going to kill. So that's why I always recommend the bleach. And the bleach, uh, those that proportion of bleach to water is what we in the DNR recommend to people for cleaning their feeders. What about vinegar? Vinegar is fine. Um, under certain circumstances, but at the height of winter, when those birds are congregating and sharing their germs, I think that it is best to stick with the bleach. There's a lot of things that vinegar won't kill. Holly can probably um, pipe in here because when she worked for wildlife, she probably routinely saw the very long list of diseases that birds can transmit. I mean, it's unreal. You you would be really surprised at the length of that list. Mm -hmm. Bleach is really best for killing any sort of pathogens that might potentially impact birds. So I I clean with bleach because it's the best. <laughs> you're still diluting it with water, mm -hmm. so you're not you're not. And if you wear rubber gloves, and I was going to say that if you're not a regular shopper at the Dollar Tree you might want to start becoming one because the Dollar Tree has the smaller bottles of Dawn dish detergent, antibacterial. They, they have great scrub brushes that you can just throw away and not be worried about the investment in your scrub brush. And they've got rubber gloves all the time. Those dishwashing thick gloves that protect your hands from the bleach. And then do you have any suggestions for somebody who, especially during the winter months, um, you know, rinsing for five or 10 minutes is not really an option, just given weather circumstances, you know, soaking it, or what would be an alternative option there, Beth? Uh, I bring mine into my mudroom sink, and then I just bleach the sink out when I'm done. So if you don't have a mudroom sink um, or a place, you know, indoors where you can do it and your faucets outside are winterized I don't know it's going to be pretty hard for you to keep those feeders clean but I suppose you could take them to if you have a dog water I don't even know if they let you take them in the dog wash station do you have any idea about that I was trying to think of like some alternative Holly but um yeah I don't know what do you think about the dog wash station? They probably would get mad if people brought their feeders <laughs> there to clean them. That's like a good alternative if you uh, could sneak um, in there. <laughs> yeah. But like, bath, you use I mean, the bathtub. Yeah. yeah, the bathtub. I mean, ideally, you'd have a utility sink. You wouldn't be using it. But I will say that, you know, I had a turtle as a pet, and we, we unfortunately do not have a utility sink. And we used the bathtub, and then I disinfected that when we were done, when I would clean the the stuff. So unfortunately, we don't have a great answer for that. All right. With that, um, we'll come back. Somebody had an avian flu question. We'll answer that when we get back. Um, so let's see. It's 1117. Let's come back at 1125. So that gives us an eight minute break and we'll go through um, the next sections. We'll see you back here in a few.
All right. And we are back. And next up is Holly will be discussing avian influenza or bird flu, uh, where it's at, what the recommendation is by the DNR for feeding birds. And from there, we'll go into some tips and tricks, um, some resources, and then wrap things up. So Holly, take it away. All right. So I'm I'm certain that you've heard about highly pathogenic avian influenza in the news. Um, it's part of the reason why chicken and eggs are so expensive right now is that domestic flocks have been um, infected with this virus that's been around for a little over a year now. So um, avian influenza is of course caused by a virus that can infect wild birds and domestic poultry and waterfowl as well. Now, the species here in Michigan that are most likely gonna have avian influenza are waterfowl, raptors, and sometimes crows and jays. So if you don't have a lot of birds like that coming to your feeder, for example, I, still have my bird feeding station up because I primarily see chickadees, woodpeckers, house sparrows, finches, things like that at my feeder. I rarely get blue jays. I rarely get crows. Um, I don't see waterfowl or hawks visiting my feeder. So I feel comfortable making the choice to feed birds in the winter time um, because I don't have some of the species that do carry uh, or are more likely to carry avian influenza around my feeder. I also don't have domestic poultry in my backyard. If I did have, you know, mallards or wood ducks or um, other creatures, geese that, that come to my bird feeders, or um, if I have a lot of crows, a lot of jays coming to my feeder, I would probably opt um, to be a little bit more careful, maybe clean a little bit more frequently, or take my feeders down altogether. So we feeder birds are less likely than other types of birds to carry avian influenza. So it's, it's a risk. Um, it can be a risk, but it, again, if you don't have those feeders that are more likely to carry, or those birds that are more likely to carry avian influenza at your feeders, then um, you can feel comfortable feeding birds if you would like to. Now, of course, there are other diseases that birds can certainly catch um, at bird feeders. Keeping your feeders clean, though, is going to be the best way to prevent those diseases from occurring at your feeder. Um, avian conjunctivitis or finch eye disease is certainly um, a concern and can be passed, especially among house finches at feeders. But again, keeping those feeders nice and clean, feeding, um, if you have a lot of finches, feeding weekly or biweekly is really going to prevent diseases like that from occurring at your feeder. Um, so, um, People can certainly carry the virus on their shoes, clothes, equipment, and vehicles. So if you do have domestic poultry, be mindful of that, that you could potentially track that virus from your chicken coop to a bird feeding station if you wear your shoes from one area to another. Um, we have avian influenza in many different counties, 60 of 83 different counties. It's been reported in Michigan. Um, and you know, they, they're all over the state, Upper Peninsula and Lower Peninsula. Again, mostly found in ducks, geese, raptors, cormorants, terns, and gulls, water birds. Um, what are the symptoms you should look for? Well, birds that are suffering from avian influenza may not show really any symptoms, but if they're toward the end of the disease, they might show some neurological symptoms. There might be some head drooping or just strange movement that they're giving. If they swim, they might be swimming in circles. Um, they might have seizures or tremors. They may lose their appetite. They may not have much energy, might be really lethargic. 
Um, in domestic poultry, you're going to see a drop in egg production, a swollen comb, wattles, legs, or head. Um, you might see the birds sneezing or coughing or having a runny nose, a lot like when people have the flu, or they may have diarrhea. And again, that's going to be more noticeable in um, domestic poultry. Um, all right. I think that's about it. So again, you know, it, it's up to you whether you want to feed birds in this, this time of highly pathogenic avian influenza. Um, keep those feeders nice and clean and try to avoid congregating species like ducks and geese and waterfowl. All right. So with that, we're going to go into some tips for setting up your feeding stations and how to really attract birds to your feeding stations. Now, it's really important if you've just started feeding birds and you've just set up your feeding station to be patient. It's going to take a little bit of time for the birds to find your feeding station, to learn where it is, and to let their pals know where, <laughs> where your feeding station is. When we moved into this house about six years ago, it took us a good month at least until we had birds coming to the feeder. So just give it time, be patient, continue to offer food and know that they'll find it eventually. You'll want to offer a variety of foods like we talked about earlier to attract different kinds of birds and vary the heights of your feeders so that birds have more opportunities to visit the feeder. This is going to help lessen overcrowding or competition and then having a spot on the ground where you catch seed or a place under the feeder where birds like sparrows and juncos that like to feed on the ground can feed is another good strategy too. Then you have ground level birds and then birds that come to the higher feeders as well. Don't overfeed your birds. Like we talked about, you know, seed can get moldy and damp. Just fill your feeders with a one or two day supply to keep it nice and fresh for birds. Don't worry if you end up like skipping a day, if you forget to feed the birds one day or even for a week, um, the birds are gonna be fine. You probably have neighbors that have feeders um, and there are plenty of natural food sources too, depending on the time of year um, that birds can find other food. You wanna place your feeders in a nice sheltered location out of the most severe wind and storms. Think like a bird, where would you wanna find food. And then also make sure that there is um, good cover that the birds can escape too quickly if they need to, if there's a predator that comes around like a cat or a hawk or something like that, a place where they can fly into a neighboring spruce or um, fly up into the tree canopy to get away from any potential predators. Um, when you're refilling your feeders, again, dump out old or damp bird seed before you refill and clean those feeders often. Um, if it's snowy, you'll want to brush the snow, the snow that sometimes accumulates on top of your feeders, brush that snow away before you fill them, and then stamp down or kind of shovel deep snow around your feeding station to provide better access for juncos and sparrows that feed down on the ground and morning doves and things like that. Um, so it's a really good idea, again, to have that cover that birds can fly away to. Um, we have our feeding station near uh, one of our silver maples that has some low hanging branches that they can fly up into really quickly. And then in the winter time, we pile up all the sticks that fall during the winter in our fire pit. And so that's a really great place. We often see juncos and house sparrows flying in there to get some cover in a little teepee of sticks in our fire pit um, so they can find some safety. Now, we've mentioned this before, but it's really important to keep your cats indoors and to talk to your neighbors about keeping their cats indoors as well. Um, Many thousands of birds fall victim to house cats each year. They're just following their instincts to hunt. So let your cat do their bird watching indoors, keep them uh, inside where it's safer for the birds and better for the cat too. And then we've also talked about window strikes and there are a lot of different things that you can do to keep uh, birds from striking 
windows and, and being killed by window strikes. Certainly placing your feeding station further away from the window can help with that, um, but you can also put various decals, um, stickers, you can use paint um, to, to paint the outside of the window, like a paint pen to paint stripes on the window or hash marks. They sell special mylar tape that you can use to hang in front of the window. It's kind of um, loud and so it blows in the wind and um, makes some noise and can scare birds away or other creatures that you don't want to have around. Or you can use some of this uh, decal kind of striping stuff or a paint pen to make stripes on a window. Um, if a bird does strike your window, leave it alone to see if it will recover on its own. Maybe put it in a box or something that's going to protect it a little bit away from um, cats or any prowling um, predators that might be around. If it doesn't fly away or it appears to be injured, only a licensed wildlife rehabilitator can legally take care of it. So you can find a list of rehabbers in our list of resources that we're going to send you. Um, it's on the DNR website. You can find it a couple different places, michigan.gov slash wildlife. Um, on that page, you can find a list or michigandnr.com slash DLR. Again, we'll, we'll have this written down for you in the packet of materials that you get. So those wildlife rehabilitators can advise you on what to do with the bird until you can get them to them for proper medical care. So don't take care of birds on your own. Let a, a licensed wildlife rehabilitator do that. Um, you'll want to, <laughs> you know, bird feeders can have two meanings. <laughs> Big birds need to eat too, and, and two of the birds that we will see around feeders are Cooper's hawks and sharp-shinned hawks. There's a sharp-shinned hawk on the left, Cooper's hawk on the right, um, and they eat other birds. So they're going to fly into your feeder looking for birds that they can eat. Although this seems unpleasant, remember that they need to eat as well and are part of, part of the food web. Um, it's helpful to make sure that your feeders are in a nice covered location so that birds can make a quick getaway if, the, if you do have a hawk like this fly into your, your feeders. And if it becomes a frequent problem where you have hawks coming daily to your feeders, you might have to remove your feeders for a, a while until the hawk moves on and finds another hunting space. Um, squirrels can certainly be pesky <laughs> at bird feeders. Again, some people really enjoy feeding the squirrels. Some people find them to be a nuisance. Um, food is scarce for squirrels in the winter, especially when the weather is more harsh. Although a lot of times they'll spend the very harshest weather, you know, tucked into their nests and they won't be eating very much during that time. But um, there, you can always, um, set up separate feeding stations for squirrels, like we talked about earlier, having corn cobs or peanuts elsewhere in the yard that the squirrels can, can use. Um, you can use squirrel-proof feeders. They have feeders that will close under the weight of a heavier animal, um, like a squirrel. Um, you can see this squirrel-proof feeder on the left isn't doing a great job keeping this squirrel out. <laughs> so sometimes they're smarter than the squirrel proof feeders. Um, again, you can put squirrel baffles on your poles. You can grease your poles like Elizabeth mentioned. You can use a slinky on your pole or PVC pipe that can be slippery and tough for the squirrels to climb up. Um, so again, we talked a little bit about capsaicin earlier, that capsaicin can deter mammals, but again, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology cautions against that use because there hasn't been enough research into the effects of high doses of capsaicin in birds. Deer can certainly be a challenge around bird feeding stations, and we definitely want to discourage them from congregating right now because of chronic wasting disease and um, bovine tuberculosis. So like Elizabeth mentioned, 
electric fence can be a good solution for placing around your, your feeding structure so you don't have deer coming to your bird feeders. Um, raking up the seed underneath your feeder and hanging your feeders at least eight feet high um, so that deer can't reach them are good ideas as well. You can also string your feeders um, on a, a high cable to keep the deer from getting to them or put some fencing around your bird feeding station as well. Or if you have deer really coming in frequently, you can remove those feeders for a time until the deer move on and, and find other food sources. Raccoons can certainly be a challenge <laughs> at bird feeders too. They enjoy eating the bird seed as well. You can use baffles below your bird feeder, similar um, to squirrel baffles to keep them off, um, or hang your feeders from a horizontal cable that raccoons will be less likely to find. Um, hang your feeders far away from a tree limb. If they're very close to the, the trunk of a tree or even a tree limb, raccoons are great climbers and they can get to those fairly easily. Um, you may want to use aluminum flashing, um, like a, a metal sheet around the bottoms of trees, the trunks of trees, so that the raccoons can't climb up that slippery metal flashing to get to bird feeders that might be hung in a tree. And then with bears, like I said, best policy is to not feed birds when bears are active. Only feed the bears during hibernation months. Um, even if you could bear proof your feeder, bears should not associate homes or dwellings with food because they're going to return again and again looking for those food sources. So best advice is when it starts to warm up, when we have 50, 60 degree days, take those feeders down um, to avoid the risk of bears at your bird feeders. And then sometimes other birds can be the problem. You may not want to have, you know, some of the blackbirds that are kind of bossy with the other birds or um, invasive species like um, house sparrows or starlings at your feeders. You can use feeders that are better for smaller birds, like Elizabeth was talking about using feeder like Niger thistle feeders that aren't as attractive to these blackbirds and house sparrows. Use tube feeders that have very short perches and no tray at the bottom. You can see the, the tube feeder that these house sparrows are really enjoying have a tray underneath where they can land and longer perches that they can land on. But if you use shorter perches, no tray at the bottom, you're less likely to have some of these big birds using your, your tube feeders. Avoid platforms for feeding on the ground. Grackles and red-winged blackbirds and starlings and house sparrows will use those platform feeders. Um, and you can use starling-proof feeders for suet. And those are uh, suet feeders that are upside down that woodpeckers and nuthatches can get to really easily with their specialized feet that allow them to hang upside down. But starlings and house sparrows can't get to these feeders because they, they just don't have the, the power or the gripping strength to use these upside down feeders. And then of course you can um, Look for those feeders that close under the weight of heavy creatures like other birds or squirrels and um, squirrels with, or squirrels, <laughs> feeders with some caging or mesh around them to keep larger birds off of those feeders. All right. Very good. Okay, I'm going to hand things over now to Sheena. Thank you. All right. Let me get my screen. We're going to wrap things up. We've got about 15 minutes left. Um, so let me get, let's see, here we go. Sit with us because we do have those prizes. So you got to be here, got to be here to, to see it. So Elizabeth, 
Can you give me a thumbs up? Is my citizen science screen on? Wonderful. All right, friends. So I want to talk a little bit about just what citizen science is, how you can participate, because there are lots of opportunities with birds. So choose a citizen science project and join hundreds and thousands of thousands of people in recording bird observations, backyard, city streets, or forests. Your participation helps scientists reveal how birds are affected by environmental changes. So scientists cannot be everywhere. So some of the ways we can participate and help is with um, some of the citizen science projects with birds. So one of probably um, the most popular is called the Great Backyard Bird Count. And so this is something that is through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So I'm going to get to that site and show you real quick, like, oh, I don't know why that's coming up. Hold on. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not doing what I want it to. So we'll just run through and I'll talk about each one. So here we go. Um, the Great Backyard Bird Count. This is for four days in February. And these are the 2022 dates. I know it's the weekend of February 18th this year for 2023. Now, the great thing is all you have to do is observe birds for at least, I think it's 15 minutes. And then you go to the website and you record that information and that gets submitted to Cornell. So we get this picture, this snapshot of where these birds are during the winter. So this is a really fun one. If you are near Southwest Michigan, we will be doing a bird walk with the Audubon Society of Kalamazoo um, on the 18th at 10 a.m. at Wolf Lake. And that's on our webpage. So this is one of my, I hope this works because this is a really neat resource. Oh, goodness. Why is this? Hold on. I'm sorry, friends. Is it popping up in another window? I'm looking there? for it. I'm not seeing it, which is why it's so... Uh, hold on. Let me see. I'm going to try it again. Okay, there we go. Got it. I'm going to bring it over. Sorry about this. Isn't technology fun? <laughs> okay, there, see, I did have it open. All right, hold on. Bear with me, friends, because this is really cool, this one is. Okay, Elizabeth Holly, is that up? The blue screen? Yes, it's up now. And is, it, is everybody hearing me? Because I'm getting some feedback. Okay, let's try this. All right, so if you go to Cornell Lab and go to Project Feeder Watch, which is another one of the options, you can, oh, and it's still loading. I don't know what's going on with my connection. So we'll just, okay, view bird list, here we go. So if you go on Cornell's uh, webpage and you get to, you go under Project Feeder Watch, which is um, similar to the bird count, but you do it throughout the winter. Um, so you, you commit to doing it, I believe it's twice a week for a minimum of 15 minutes. The same idea, you then submit it. You can get an app on your phone. It's very easy. Um, it's a wonderful way to stay connected. But here, I love this. If we go over on the left here, you can choose your region. So I'm gonna choose the Northeast winter region. And then right here, you can choose your food type. And right now I have it um, selected for all food types. And then if I wanna change that, and let's say I only have black oil sunflower, these are the birds that might come. Oh, and down here you've got feeder types. So you can mix and match and what you have and maybe what you want to attract, and this will help guide you. So it's a lot of what we've discussed today with, um, with Elizabeth and Holly about types of birds and the feeders that types of feeders and the birds that use them, but this is an online resource. So this is just a great, a great resource. So I'm going to get rid of that. Okay, let's keep moving and grooving. 
Another great resource to use um, is called Merlin. So this can help you identify birds. It's also a free app you can put on your phone and it asks you basic questions. Um, is it, I think it's five questions. So if I'm looking at a bird at my feeder, um, it will ask me, you know, approximate size, the main um, dominant colors and different things. And then it will give me what bird or birds, it sometimes can give you more than one, that it thinks it is. And then that actually gets tracked um, for Cornell. So then they know where the birds are. You can also do it by song. Um, so if you have a bird song, you can hold up your phone and record that and it will tell you what it thinks it is. And it's it's pretty accurate. And then the other thing you can do is if you have a picture of a bird, especially if you're you know at bird feeders, you might get a pretty close shot. Um, you can use that with the app as well to try to identify things. So this is a really cool resource that I really like. Um, and then eBird. So I am not the best eBirder, but most of my birder friends use this pretty religiously. Um, I think, Holly, are you a big eBird person? I feel like you are. <laughs> yeah. So um, you have your own kind of account and you can track where you see birds and, and all of those details. Um, you can track photos. You can keep your life list here if you are a birder. Um, and again, this is recording information for Cornell so they have an, a sense of where things are. Um, they can, you can get rare bird alerts. So the evening grosbeak. beak, um, I, I wouldn't consider that rare right now, but in some years it might be. So it, it could be, for example, just something somebody's and it gets posted and then you might get an alert that tells you hey there's a rare bird um there are people that flock all over the state for different birds elizabeth i'm sure you've had this at hoffmaster i remember probably going back 15 years we had a yellow headed black bird at the fish hatchery and this this male stayed for like two weeks and we had people from all over the state coming to see this bird and he just got a little bit he got a little bit sidetracked and when he was traveling um so he's pretty rare so but it was through eBird that people were able to see hey that's where that bird is so it's a really cool uh resource as well I don't want to um, forget Audubon because we've been really touting Cornell. They both have a ton of great information. So I would say um, I'm more familiar with Cornell, but I use it more. But I think Audubon is a great resource as well. And they have information um, similar and probably some different stuff on there too. But that'd be a great resource as well. There's also a Michigan Audubon page. Again, all of this will be in your resources. Um, this is just showing you the homemade treats for birds that will send you feeding winter birds, lots of um, websites that uh, Elizabeth, Holly, and I put together that you'll get in an email uh, following the program. And then now this is the fun part. Um, this is because you stuck with us for three hours. Um, a couple, you know, technology blips, which, you know, wasn't too bad today. We've had much worse. So <laughs> I feel fortunate. Um, we have some prizes. And so what I have done is I have put all of your names. I put them in my bag and I am going to pick one out. And then what did we decide, Elizabeth? Um, We'll go left to right. So the first yes. one I pick will be this Feed the Birds book. The second one I pick will be the Feeder in the Middle. And the third will be the Bringing Nature Home. Yep. Elizabeth is going to record who you are. You do have to be present to win. So just drop us in the Q&A that, yep, I'm here. And so we'll make sure that this, I don't know if it'll come with your book. It depends on if it's already gone out. Ideally, it would come together, but some of you might have already got your book, books shipped to you. So with that, okay, I'm doing this totally legit. All right, the first winner of Feed the Birds is, I got to put my reading glasses on, Kathy Wiley. So Kathy Wiley, you are the winner of Feed the Birds by Chris Early. So congratulations, Kathy. Is she there, Elizabeth, or do I have to pick another one? Let's see. Oh, no, she's here. She's here. All right. Woo! All right. Congratulations, Kathy. All right. Here's, see, this is, I, that feeder is beautiful. So I really, I'm really uh, excited for whoever gets that too. So, all right, here we go. All right. Okay. The winner of the bird feeder is Hugh Flack. Hugh, are you with us? Hugh Flack. So that beautiful feeder, Elizabeth has it and she will uh, get it all. Is Hugh with us or is he one that didn't? Uh, yeah, 
Yep. All right, he is. All right. Okay, last but not least, of course, um, Bringing Nature Home, How You Can Attract with Native Plants, and it's a really great book. All right, here we go. All right. Dun, da, da, da. Stacy Schinkel, if I pronounce that right, Stacy Schinkel, Schinkel, or Schinkel. So, is that? Do we have uh, Stacy oh, with us? Yep, she says she's here. We're all here. All right, excellent. Uh, so. Friends, we have had so much fun with you today, sharing all of this with you. We want you to feed birds. We want you to feel confident. We want the birds to be safe. Um, we will also get you all of our email addresses. They are up on the screen right now, um, but, and they are also available um, on our web pages and different, you know, you'll be able to contact us. So uh, we could now open it up um, to questions if people have things. Otherwise, if you, we have just overwhelmed you, you have so much information um, that you need a break, please feel free to, to leave the, the program, but we will stick around for any last questions. So thank you so much, everybody. We appreciate you taking time out of your Saturday to learn about feeding birds. Shana, I did wanna say, that if anybody's interested in birdscaping their yard, the DNR does offer programs periodically and you can uh, go to um, the Gillette Nature Association Facebook page where I un frequently announce uh, programs that we're gonna be offering um, at Hoffmaster State Park. Uh, but we also, I can also provide many resources for you and Shane's gonna be sharing my contact information I have a lot of experience um, with native plants and can help you out. And if you have a lot of property, there's the private landowners program that can do it on a larger scale. I think Elizabeth's talking more a little bit about, you know, kind of backyards, but yeah, there's there are tons of resources within the DNR too. And that'll all be on um, that list. So questions, anybody? Are there some in there? Well, we're getting a lot of um, people saying thank you and that they really enjoyed the program, which is really nice to hear. We appreciate that feedback. 